Good morning, everybody. It's very bright out here today, as you can see. You know, the sunglasses need to come off because they're also misty and I could not see a thing. But you are watching the Safari Live pre-drive drive. My name is Taylor and on camera with me today is David. And we are hopefully going to find you plenty of animals. There's been lions, there's been leopard activity at the Vuyatilla Dam on the dam cam. So for those who have stayed up to all hours of the morning, thank you very much. Oh no, it could be the afternoon for some of you. Um, thank you very much, of course, for doing that and letting us know that there were some creatures that visited, because that definitely helps us. But uh, now we need to try and find them, which is always the hardest part first thing in the morning, with the light not being so great. It means tracking the footprints on the ground is a little bit more on the difficult side, but we'll give it a bash anyway. So we are going up shortcut Gallego towards the cut. Which means then that the animals are still on the property. That's the, the for goal today. And then what else? And then we'll sit with leopards taking on, or we'll sit with the leopards stalking something, and then the lions will be roaring. How does that sound, David? Yeah. Now, if only the animal... Oh, yes, was the... Was that the back door? The boot? <laughs> the back door was coming open. That was a little bit of a problem. So we've closed it now, so no one is going to be falling out. Whoa. I just felt very... It's had this overwhelming sensation of dizziness come over me. We just need to take a moment. Let's not drive while I'm dizzy. That was a bit strange. I think I might be. I think I might just be okay. That was very weird though. We'll just drive very slowly. Don't worry, David, there's nothing. I can't, if I pass out, I won't drive off the side of the road. So <laughs> we might just go into a little tree, yes. But it wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be too bad. We'll just give it a go. Right, let's do this very <laughs> Let's see what we've got out. out. Well, blah, 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 blah. My goodness, what's going on with me today, David? I feel like my, my brain is malfunctioning and um, something's going to break in a moment. I had a very small coffee this morning, a little one, because. Oh, hello, bushbuck. A little bushbuck hiding away, and it actually could have been an Inyala. I didn't shine my spotlight on it for long enough. I just saw brown and white, so it's one of those two antelope. I didn't want to keep the spotlight on it for too long. Um, I, yeah, I just had a little coffee this morning. It was not a big one, because I never can never finish a full cup of coffee. All right, Tristan's looking for me. Here's my game drive radio. Standing by. had anything just yet uh, so I'll, I'll probably weave back down and check around Gallego Pan as well. <clears throat> I just then said that the tracks of the male line go west which is good because we're not checking west now we're north but we'll go back round and maybe we actually won't even come down here maybe we'll go all the way towards Sydney's David and do a quick loop and then come back for your teleaxis because that's what we're gonna have to do in the end. So the route that the lions like to walk, but it sounds like it was a big male lion that was at the dam. And we did hear one coming from far away. Right, I'm going to say goodbye to all of you and we'll see you shortly. We're about to start the show. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. As the darkness gives way to the light, slowly the tracks of a king are revealed. This is Safari Live.
morning everybody and welcome to a beautiful sunrise safari. The sun is just coming up and as you can see we have male lion tracks to follow. Now my name is Tristan, on camera this morning I've got Senzo and so we are going to try and see if we can't find where this male lion went. Thank you to all of you that sent through your um, information about the male lion being at the dam and the leopard sawing. It certainly has helped us get onto these tracks quite quickly. So remember, you the viewers are the most important and so you can send through any more information that you have as to where this lion went from the dam or if you have any questions about Africa in general on hashtag safari live. Right, let's get into our tracking as soon as possible because these male lions, the Birminghams, they like to come into this area and they seem to like to Houdini in and out. So while we've got a bit of time and it's not too light just yet, I'm hoping that this male lion hasn't moved too far. But knowing the Birminghams and knowing the way that they can move, it's very possible that these guys have gotten, well this particular male lion, who I think is the Birmingham, has gotten quite far away already. So I want to try and quickly just check where these tracks end up going. Now the tracks that I have got came down towards the dam and seem to be heading in a westerly direction so like I say if there's anybody out there that actually saw where this male lion went from the dam remember hashtag safari live other than that I think Taylor's going to try and give me a hand and see if she can't just do the northern sections see if there isn't any sign of lions up that way there was also that leopard that was sawing away I believe in the early hours of the morning and I know Taylor is very keen to see a leopard so she's going to while she does that just check around for any signs of leopard as well so it has a air of promise and it has from the dam cam it means it's very exciting for us to get going in the morning there's a sort of hope and a atmosphere of something could be around any corner which is fantastic and it will make a good way. It would be a great way to start the day to have a male lion. I can't remember actually the last time I saw a lion on Juma. It was a very long time ago and so I'm hoping that we do have one of the Birminghams. And I know there was a lion that was also calling around 12 o'clock-ish. Um, so I would imagine that this is that same lion. It was calling kind of to the east of the camp so where these tracks have come from seems that they've come from that way. Now I just need to see where they go from here because it seems like they just disappear from the dam. Don't see anything going that way. Maybe they head southwards. Now just looking to see if there is any sign of this male but I don't see any tracks coming south from the dam itself so you must have headed on west towards quarantine so I'll just loop back up towards quarantine I didn't see anything when I came down this morning but it was still very very dark and to see tracks in the dark of uh, of night is really quite tough it's not easy especially for just one male line walking along and so we might have missed them but I'm going to head back that way and just quickly have a little look and check what's going on other than that it's a beautiful morning it's surprisingly quite warm this morning I actually don't feel too cold at all. I thought it would be a little bit cooler than when I was last year but it's actually not too bad. It's starting to kind of get to just as that sun rises you know you get that little sort of bite in the air and gets a little bit cooler but it's actually not too bad at all. It's quite pleasant out here and it looks like it's going to be a beautiful day. There's not a cloud in the sky at the moment. It's just bare sky all above me here which is really quite nice. So as you can see there there's not a single cloud anywhere to be seen. But our male lion definitely didn't come south from the dam itself. So like I say, if you did see it, then maybe you can let me know as to which way it went. Ah, okay, so you're saying the lion went northeast from the dam wall. Well, we'll definitely check that out. Like I say, Taylor is north of where I am. So I'm going to let her just check around Gallagher's side. I think I'm going to head a little bit further east of where she is and see if maybe it didn't go up towards Bifflesook Dam. Now the problem is, is when male lions go northeast from the dam, it's actually not a very long walk at all until they get to the Bifflesook boundary. So I'm hoping that something has distracted him and he's ended up lying down somewhere, but it's 
not that encouraging when they head north. If they head west or east or even south, then it's a lot easier for us to be able to try and see if we can't find him. So hopefully he'll pop out somewhere close by and we'll be able to see where he is. And like I say, Taylor is on that side and so I'm sure she'll pick up the tracks if it does head that way. And I haven't seen any sign of the leopard either. There's, I don't know if anybody actually saw it on the dam cam or if it was just the sawing that happened. Um, but I haven't seen any signs or footprints for a leopard yet either. So that'll be quite interesting to see where that was coming from and who indeed that was because yesterday we had those tracks for the mating pair and so it would be interesting if maybe that's potentially that male that's come this way. I'm just looking here, I thought I saw somewhere where something was lying on the road but it could just be the elephant footprints. There are a few tracks for elephants that have been going up and down. I'm sure it's that same herd that Jamie had yesterday afternoon. We're not too far from where Jamie had that herd and they look like a delightful bunch. We were watching the clip when we got back to camp and uh, it was really quite entertaining to watch that poor little baby trying to struggle to get up the bank and try and rejoin its mom. So for those of you who had missed it, it was a herd of elephants that Jamie was with and this little baby got stuck in the riverbed and the mother on top of him, was, the baby was trying to get up but it kept trying to climb the steepest bank possible and two of its siblings were not helping in any way whatsoever. Now I think there are some tracks here, I just need to see. Okay, so we have, there we go, there's tracks for our leopard and lion are both here. Now I'm going to try to see if I can't find a track where you can see the size difference between these two because it's quite interesting to see. Um, let's go back here a little bit. Senzo, this is going to be quite tough for you because it's very close, but let's try. Okay, so over here, I don't know if you can get that Senzo, is that going to be okay? Where the light is, oof. The car is going to be a bit close. Let's just try and reposition. I've got a big bush on my left hand side which is not making this easy, but let's try. So I believe a lot of you are saying that the line, that this line went northwest, not northeast. Okay, well that's great news. We'll try and see what we can find. But at the back there, again, sorry Senzo, it's not really good, is it? Um, let's try find another one. Ah, there it is. That's a better one there. Okay, so where my light is, if we have a look, it's very difficult to see. So I'm going to get out and circle it for you. But there is a leopard track there in amongst all of that, which is almost impossible to see. But let me go and show you. So... It's interesting to see now who this could be because it looks like a female leopard and there was a leopard calling. Now I know there's not very much light but I just want to circle it because it's going to make it much easier to see and then I will find you the male lion track as well. But let's get a bit of light onto that and we'll be able to then see it a little bit better now I think. There we go. Okay so you can see the back of the pad just where the light is touching there and then the toes coming forward. Now I'm just trying to see nicely, it's actually now that I see it, it looks a little bit more male than female. So that's a front foot for a male leopard and then the male line was a little bit further ahead walking up the road but that one's not very clear so I'm going to try and find a better example of all of this because the light is not very good and it's very difficult to actually show you the difference between the two. But at least we're heading the right direction, it means that we're heading the way that the leopard is heading. Taylor's heading the way that the lions are heading, so we're all getting everything covered at this stage, which is great news. Hmm, now I wonder where this leopard went to and who this could be. There's a few Franklins that are alarm calling and sounding a little bit upset in this area, so I wonder if maybe this leopard hasn't disturbed everybody. Let's see if it didn't cross. Just gonna go check down towards Chelapan because Chelapan is often a nice place for the leopards to go. And then if you head towards um, Twin Dams, we know that most of our leopards like to go that area. So Tingana, Hosana, Shongile, they're all happy to head into that area. And so maybe, just maybe, this leopard is somewhere at one of these pans having an early morning drink. It's 
Franklins on my left keep going and calling. They're not too flustered, but they're making a little bit of an alarm call, so I'll bear that in mind. I just want to check if the tracks come out further ahead. If they do, then we know that this leopard is already passed. If not, then I'm going to go back to where those Franklins are alarm calling and just see if maybe there's something in that riverbed there. The problem with where they are calling at the moment is that it is very, very dense, very, very thick, and it's not an easy place to negotiate, so I'm just going to try and see if I can't find the tracks further on. And I should probably plug myself in back into the car because otherwise I'm not going to be able to hear Alice one bit and then she's going to shout at me. So let me plug myself back in. There we go. Now I should be able to hear the voices inside my head again, which will make Final Control much happier. So, Tim from Australia, you're saying is it only lion and leopard that give away territorial signs? I think that was the question that came through. Ah, male leopards, no. So, it's not only male leopards that will soar, you'll find that female leopards will soar quite regularly as well. And now, a female leopard, the reason why she would soar is, I suppose, a territorial sound. If she feels like there's another female in that area, she could potentially soar. Um, but it's more to do with finding a mate. So you'll find a female leopard when she's looking for a male leopard to mate with, she'll make quite a lot of noise to attract the attention of that male and try and get him to notice that she's around and then head into that direction. So it does happen that they will soar quite a bit and they do definitely scent mark like a male leopard would do and make quite a bit of sort of display that they are display that they are in the area. I'm just checking very carefully now if I can't see where this leopard went. The road here is incredibly hard. And it's not easy to see these tracks in this dingy morning light. The sun hasn't come up yet, so we don't have too many shadows being cast onto the road. And that makes it a lot harder to actually see what's going on. So I'm just trying to check. Now... Unfortunately, I mentioned earlier that Taylor will be checking the northern side. Apparently, she's not feeling very well at all, so we're going to have to wish Taylor a speedy recovery. And so instead, we're going to have the Mr. James Henry that's going to be joining us. So while that all happens, you're going to be with me, and we're going to carry on and see what else we can find. Now, I hear there is a bit of chatter on the radio, so I'm going to just listen quickly to what's happening there so that I can hear if they've managed to pick up on anything. I seem to leopard tracks, which means one thing and one thing only is that maybe, just maybe, those Franklins that we heard alarming just now could be leading us to some. Good morning and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. Apparently, Tristan disappeared off your screens in mid-sentence, for which we do apologize. That seems as though he had an attack of the gremlins. My name is Jamie, and this morning Ferg is on camera with me, and it is a truly beautiful morning, but because it is winter and our days are getting shorter, we had to sit and wait for it to get light. Sitting outside, Taylor was out, Tristan was out, and we just had to sit and wait for our chance. So obviously, you don't go stumbling around in the bush at night or in the dark on foot. So exciting stuff planned for my morning's sunrise bushwalk. Obviously, we're starting off with our wildebeest and our herd of impala on the open area outside of camp, just because they've become, well, basically part of our lives. We see them each and every single day, the wildebeest herd wandering about, the impala, but... I'm not interested in the wildebeest today. No, not, not that I'm not interested. But my plan for the morning, because I think the hyenas have moved their den, is to go and check the older den sites and to see if we can work out where they might be. And even if I eliminate a couple of possibilities, Aubrey's, Galago, and Vubu, all of the places where I know our spotted hyena have been in the past, 
then at least we have a rough idea as to where to start looking from the vehicles. The signs that we're looking for, well, I'll explain those to you once we get out and about and once we get to one of the old den sites and we can discuss whether or not those cubs have moved there. I had a brief check on my way through, just driving from where I live to the main camp, and I saw lots and lots and lots of hyena tracks. I don't know if any of you heard anything on the dam camera last night. I know that you saw a leopard and I know that you saw a lion, but maybe if you saw any hyena, it might also be quite a useful giveaway as to where they might have moved. And as we stroll along, don't forget to send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. We'd love to hear from you all. Obviously, walking out here in the bush, we've got to be very alert, which I can't always give my f or devote my full attention to while I'm talking to you and while I've got this earpiece in so that you can ask questions. So as usual, we're accompanied by the wonderful Herbie, who is chatting, I think, to Tristan, would be my guess. Is Herbie over there, and Herbie does a marvelous job. <laughs> Herbie does a marvelous job of looking after us, walking ahead of us to make sure that we're not going to walk into something scary, but also using his amazing talent for spotting the small thing, which is the small things are half the fun of a morning bushwalk. Ferg, I think we need to walk faster. It's chilly. <laughs> it's chilly. Violet! Violet is wondering about her namesake flower and whether or not we have any African violets growing out here in the wild. We do. I haven't seen any in a while. I've seen lots and lots of hibiscus flowers. I have seen lots of wild jasmine, but I have not seen any African violets growing at the moment. But if I find one for you, Violet, I will show you. I promise you that I will show you. But yes, we do get them in this area, and I have seen them in the past. So that's something that we could aim to try and find for Violet. That's a lovely idea. Violet is Violet. Now oh, I'm sorry to drag myself in circles here. Is a Violet your favorite flower? I would assume so. I would guess, surely it must be. Or would you rather not be limited to what your favorite flower might be? I don't know that I have a favorite flower. <laughs> hmm. Okay. I'll stand very still. Oh, I see. Alice is talking to Tristan, not to us. Um, I can tell you where we are, Alice. I can't tell you where Tristan is. I had a momentary panic attack thinking our signal was very low right outside the <laughs> right on quarantine. I, Just, Fergus I know, Fergus is standing there going, no, weird, what's going on? <laughs> All right. Deary me, Alice, wrong radio. <laughs> Ah, oh, grand lover, you want to know how often we find pangolin. Although actually probably our best chance would be on foot. It's the only time I've ever found a pangolin is on foot. But um, how often do we see them? We've seen one once in the last two years, since I've started working at Safari Live. And that wasn't even me. That was Brent and Dave on the Kruger National Park boundary. They're around. They're very, very difficult to find. Now, pangolin for a... <clears throat> for our newer viewers, is a, is a scaly anteater, basically. It looks like a walking artichoke, and they're very, very rare. They're also very endangered, and probably one of the most trafficked animals in the world for the use of their scales in medicine. medicine. Obviously, there's absolutely no truth behind that. It's just keratin. But it's a really sweet little thing that curls up into a ball when it feels threatened, and actually very little is known about them in terms of their social structure. We know the babies ride on the mother's backs, we know that they're solitary, we know that they eat pugnacious ants, and we know that they are largely nocturnal. But the nice thing about this time of year, because it's chilly, this time in the morning and in the early afternoon, you've got a much, much better chance during our winter months of seeing something like a pangolin. And the one and only time I personally have ever found a pangolin and not responded to another one. I was tracking leopard, it was years ago now, tracking a leopard and something rustled next to me and I sort of 
walked past, looked, saw what it was, walked a little bit further. And, no, it was very exciting. I did such a mad sprint back to the vehicle to get my guests to it and then lost it for a while. Had a panic, then realized it was still there, exactly where I'd left it, just hidden. And they like to, if they do feel like you've spotted them, they like to move into dense areas like this. I'm not going in there, it's dewy. <laughs> my legs are already soaking wet from walking on quarantine. But the pangolin will go and it'll tuck itself away in there and then curl up into a ball and it'll stay completely still. You never know, we could see a pangolin, we could easily see a pangolin and be when we least expect it, like it was with Brent, where um, Re Rebecca got such a surprise that she asked me to link to an armadillo. I thought she meant an armored lizard, there was mass confusion. Either way, it was a very, very, very exciting moment. I would love to find a pangolin. I'll ask Herbie. We know how determined Herbie gets when you ask him to find something. Maybe he can help us. Apparently, there's a pangolin that walks. <laughs> I can't find an armadillo for you, Rebecca. Apparently, there's a pangolin that walks on Gauri, or used to walk on Gauri Cutline, and they'd find his tracks all the time. But a pangolin track, basically, I'll, I'll show you when it's a bit sunnier, because you're not going to see it now. It's basically just, you can barely see any toes, you can barely see any detail. It looks for all the world like just a, a nondescript impression in the sand. So tracking them down is not all that easy. But I would suspect if we found one, if we could learn the habits of one, we'd have far more luck. I think it might be, I think we're gonna learn a lot more about pangolins in the future with researchers following them about in the evenings. I wouldn't wanna follow follow a pangolin at night on foot, but there are researchers that do do it, and I take my hat off to them. I won't take my hat off because that's where my microphone is, but I would take my hat off to them if I could. The reason we're walking on the road, I hear it's dewy, but that's not the actual reason. It's because I want to check for hyena tracks on this road, and I haven't seen any, which suggests to me, there's been a lot of traffic up and down already, but it suggests to me that they're not using that Galago shortcut den yet. I don't know, it's possible. When they do use that den, or the Mvubu Road den, they use a game path that goes through this way. Now Nevin, one thing that would be really nice to find is the little pitter-patter of tiny little feet, or the little tracks of tiny little hyenas. But Nevin wants to know well, how do they move their cubs? Do they carry them or do they walk with them? Combination of both. If the cubs are starting to lag, then they will pick them up. But at the age that those cubs are now, which is a couple of months, I can't remember exactly how old they are now, time flies, but they're probably about three months old now. They're ready to walk. They're ready to walk on their own. So mom will basically call them. And typically when we see mom leave the den site, you can see how much the cubs want to go with her, but then she's got to sort of guide them back. And eventually that instinct to stay overcomes and they go back to the den site itself. But if mom's moving them, she'll call them and they'll walk with her. Obviously it's a dangerous time for a hyena cub. They're still not at their most coordinated. They're not all that fast either. So anything like a lion, particularly a lion, maybe a leopard, but unlikely. But a lion would be the biggest threat and a lion would be something that Ribbon would be the most nervous of. But she'll do it alone not necessarily with the assistance of the clan, but she will do it. You got a pretty sunrise there. We do. Have a sunrise, we right? do. That's wonderful. Make tracking a lot easier. And even more wonderful is a gentle whistle from Herbie telling me he spotted something. I'm going to, sorry, Ferg, I know you want to film the sunrise, but there's stuff to be <laughs> just walking away from Fergus. Oof, rutting impala, making a noise. For our new viewers, it's impala breeding season. So they are making lots and lots of noise at the moment. Right, let me see if I can find what 
Herbie's found without being told what Herbie's found. <laughs> what did you see, Herbs? Mm. Okay, we're gonna do some investigating. So I'm gonna send you over to Tristan while I do some thinking and some looking, and we'll be back with you shortly. Well, we're still trying to find where these leopard tracks go, but interestingly enough, I came down towards Twin Dams just to check if maybe this leopard hadn't come all the way down, and I couldn't find any further tracks for the male, but I have found tracks for what looks like Shongile. Now, it's a little young, or it's a small female leopard that's moving around on the sort of boundary area, so I'm just trying to see which way she goes from here, and whether she then goes south into Little Gauri, or is still inside Juma. But at this stage, her tracks are going down towards sort of Twin Dams area, and unfortunately, our reception down there is not very good at all. So I'm going to try and just head a little bit further north from where I am now to try and just see if I can't find her a little bit further north, but I think she might have gone towards Twin Dam side. I did drive there and I didn't see any tracks for her there. So maybe, just maybe, she's somewhere close by here and just we get lucky and she'll pop out of the grass for us. The tracks I had were on the road here going the opposite direction to me. So I would imagine that she's gone down towards Twin Dam. She loves it down there. It's one of her favorite places. So if I don't have any luck here, I might head back that way again and just see. The problem with her is that she likes to sort of twist and turn. Now, I see there's some tracks here that I just want to have a look at quickly. It looks like she turned around and is now heading back. So I just want to see, but there's her little tracks for those of you that would like to see. So over here, Senza, I don't know if you can see them there, just on the edge of the road. There we go. So there's the little footprints on the edge of the road. So over here, one and two that are moving along slowly. If you go back a little bit, Senza, I think you'll have more luck with the ones further back because they're a little bit more defined. So the other way. So Nell from USA, you want to know how old a leopard female would be when she starts to mate. Well, it depends on the female. You get different ages for different females, and Karula was one that mated very, very early in life. So she was already producing cubs at two and a half years, which is very early. Normally it's around three to four years old when they have their first litter. So um, that's about the normal age, but you will find sometimes that females can already start to mate at around two and a half years, which is really, really early. Now, I thought I heard something there. So I was just stopping and listening. There is a car that's coming past, but I thought I maybe heard a lion contact calling. It's quite difficult when there's a car driving past you because you can't hear anything anymore. But no, I can't hear anything. Sorry, Alice, if you can repeat that. I was busy listening out for our lion. Ah, so while Taylor is in bed and sick, James Hendry is now in. So he would like to say good morning to all of you, so let's bid him a very, very, very Good morning, good morning, hello, yes, how are you? I hope you're all well. I'm still slightly sort of shocked. You know, I wasn't expecting to be on drive today, so so I'm just sort of uh, preparing myself mentally. <laughs> uh, my name is James Hendry. There we go. And David is on camera today. Hashtag Safari Live is how you're going to get hold of us. Of course, you know that because Jamie and Tristan have told you that. There is the first glorious sighting of the morning. This, the 10th of May, 200, 2017 Anno Domini, or the Common Era, depending on your bent. Now, Taylor is returned to her bed. Geraldine is Mm, ministrating to her. She is uh, providing some sweet tea and a, a comforting ear. And so, with any luck, she'll be absolutely fine by the end of the drive. In the meantime, the wildebeest are making their way 
very gently down towards the north where we are sort of going to follow them. Well, we're not going to follow them. We're going to head off, to, we're going to check Gallego Pan, check the dam. Oh, David, what happened there? That looks like teenage experimentation to me. That is not uncommon, everyone. That does happen from time to time at, in just about all species, as does that, of course. That happens in all animals. Thank you very much, David, for that beautiful sighting. That's it is when an animal that is as is at its most vulnerable like that, David, and so you should really avoid pointing the camera at them. Anyway, uh, let's move on to the first thing that we saw. And that is a sort of play and dominance behavior. And of course, there is this school of thought that goes that all mammal play behavior eventually has something to do with assigning a role in the social hierarchy of whatever, well, you know, whatever pack or herd or um, troop you happen to be in. Really, the light is quite gorgeous. It's quite a chilly morning, early winter's morning. It's pretty normal. I think it's probably, if I was to guess, I'll just quickly suck the temperature out of my finger. I'd say it's probably about 18 degrees <laughs> Celsius or so, which must put us at around about 65 Fahrenheit. And apparently I was spot on there. That's fantastic. My finger is working really well this morning. Now, David, you are somebody who likes to keep what might be described as... Um, European hours, shall we say that? You know, the early morning is not necessarily your immediate preference. And uh, I've just spotted an animal that uh, would keep very similar eyes, hours to what you would keep. Can you see it there, just in front of us? Yes, there it is. There it is, just coming out to catch the first rays of the sun, a little dwarf mongoose. Now, they do not like to get up early. They like to get up only as the sun is warming their little burrows. And so that's what the sun is doing now. Just, you're going to, which is actually really cool, we, we're about to watch the sun just break onto the top of the mound. And the first little mongoose came out. And of course, unlike David, they go to bed quite early as well. David did not go to bed early last night, did you, David? No. no. Which resulted in my not going to bed particularly early either. That's all right. You know, the sound of joyful laughter outside my room until late into the evening is a... One shouldn't be a curmudgeon about these things. Do you know what a curmudgeon is, David? I am a curmudgeon. A ruiner of fun. <laughs> There's a number of them. There's a whole troop. They're all underneath the ground in their little termite mound that is no longer filled with termites. I always think that they live, other than the fact, of course, that they're small enough for just about absolutely anything to eat, I feel that they live lives of great comfort, and I wouldn't mind being a dwarf mongoose were it not for the fact that there were so many birds and other mammals that would like to eat me. That's very sweet, as they've just perfectly predicted when the sun's going to hit the top of their mound. Hello, Kimmy Ann. You're wondering about meerkats and whether these mongoose are related to meerkats. Well, indeed they are, Kimmy Ann. A meerkat is a mongoose. It's just a different kind of a mongoose. They're part of the same family, the Hesperidae, Herpestidae. I keep getting that wrong. Herpestidae, which I think probably means snake eater, although in the case of the mongoose is not always very true, uh, or this mongoose. But the meerkat lives only, or surrogate, lives only in much drier regions. So you probably find that they almost... Um, or an ecological replacement in areas where it's just slightly drier than this. So if you go up into the southern parts of Botswana, 
you'll find there's a huge amount, uh, or, or there's a lot less rain there, about 100 millimetres or so less, and from there and into the drier regions you'll find the meerkats. Now Tristan has managed to do uh, what I and everyone else has failed to do for the last five or six days. We have indeed James, and isn't this spectacular? There is the little prince sitting atop a treehouse dam wall. It's a little Hosanna, whose tracks I found just after you, we last were with you, and his were going north. So it seems like him and Shungila were together, and Shungila's tracks headed back towards Twin Dams, and his came north up Weaver's Nest, and I was pretty sure that he might head this way. So we came towards Twin Dam, I mean to Treehouse Dam, and look at that, he's lying right out in the open, just surveying his territory and watching over his water hole. He loves this particular area. I've seen Hosanna here countless times. He loves to sit atop the dam wall and watch what goes on at the water hole. And there's lots of terrapins and varying other things that occupy his mind here. And so it's a good place for him to come and see. It's also a place where Karula used to bring them quite often. And so he's quite at home with being in this area. But it is such a sight to see him in this beautiful early morning light and he's just sitting there looking ever so regal isn't he getting massive as well look at the size of his head and his neck these days he's getting huge when we first came down i thought it might be an adult female but he's already gotten much bigger he's such a beautiful cat and he's looking so healthy i'm very very impressed he's obviously completely unscathed from his little encounter with tingana the other night so for those of you who aren't aware he had a Impala kill close to Vuatela camp and Tangana came in and there was a bit of a scuffle I believe and there was sort of sounds of them getting into an argument but he looks absolutely fine he's got a very healthy coat there's no signs of any scratches or scars or cuts anywhere around there so he's looking spectacular at this stage and look at that coat he's got such a rich golden coat you often find this with male leopards is that they'll end up getting a much more sort of gold color than what the the females do the females are often a little bit lighter but his coat in this morning light is exquisite now i believe a lot of you are very happy to see little hosana and i am too it's been a while since i've seen him and he looks incredible he's looking much bigger than when the last time i saw him so really really glad that we've managed to find him and hopefully we'll be able to spend most of the morning with him i would imagine as that sun now starts to rise it's going to get warm on his back and that might get him up and moving Maybe we'll see him trying to hunt some terrapins around Treehouse Dam, but it promises to be such a good morning, and I'm so excited that we managed to find him. I was saying to Senzo, there's leopard tracks everywhere this morning, and they've been walking up and down, and so it's nice that we actually were able to find him and got lucky that he was sitting right out in the open, and he is posing beautifully. Now, I think I might just reposition just now. The problem is the sun is behind him, so if we go down towards the water, it's going to be difficult to be able to actually see him but we're going to try and see if I can't get a better view so we can actually see his face oh hello Hosanna good morning isn't he beautiful you're looking a bit dopey this morning my boy but he is getting so big and he's got that typical sort of Karula male offspring look they all look quite similar to me so Mishu and Duna, Shivambalan, Quarantine, Kunuma they've all got that very kind of boxy face absolutely beautiful now we are going to spend most of the morning like i said with this male leopard and see what he gets up to and while we do that i believe jamie's got something slightly more delicate to show all of you um i do indeed have something more delicate to show you in the form of a sunrise and i guess you could describe it as delicate because no two sunrises are ever the same and it's so transient and gone in just a few seconds and highlighted by the gorgeous yellow flowers of this the senna it really is a very pretty combination so it's an utterly stunning morning and what a wonderful start i know tristan is going to be grinning from ear to ear uh, as soon as he gets back for breakfast i know he's going to be so excited there's nothing that tristan loves more than to find a young male leopard or any leopard actually and we've had, uh, let me just tell you what we found so that we can try and make sense of it. I, I'm not going to try and give you any explanation. The thing that Herbie whistled at me to tell me about was an old female leopard track, about two days old. 
adult, looks like an adult female. It's hard to tell because it's so old and it's in such soft sand that it's spread a little bit. In the middle of Juma, don't know. Looks like an adult female. Could be Karula, we don't know. It could be one of the other females wandering in, taking over a vacant portion of the territory because Karula hasn't been calling and hasn't been scent marking as far as we know. I don't know. Make of it what you will. I'll just let you know that that's what we found. I'm hopeful. Let's see how it plays out over the next few days because if there's been a female walking there once, let's see whether or not she comes back. Now, speaking of leopards, of course, Karula, I think you should head back across and see her son who is sitting up in the sun. So Hosanna is, isn't that beautiful? He's being backlit by this early morning rising sun and the grass is catching all of that light and the edge of his coat and he looks so, so beautiful up on this damn wall. He's such a nice image watching him, just watching and seeing what's going on. Now he has stood up and he's looking around so I don't think he's going to be there for too much longer. He might give us a big yawn. He's, oh, what have you seen Hosanna? Seems like he's going into a bit of a stalk mode. You can see he's very interested in something. His ears have perked forward, his head is lowered slightly, and he's looking as though he's a lot more aware of something. I wonder if maybe there isn't something that's approaching the waterhole. You sometimes will find at this time of the day that some of the animals like impalas and kudu will come and have an early morning drink. And I wonder if maybe one of them is not on its way that he's noticed because he's definitely gone into a sort of stalking posture where he's watching very carefully. See, look, he's now slinking off. Oh, no, big yawn. Full image with the light coming through the grass. Amazing. Hello, my boy. He's looking so good. And look, his tummy looks quite full as well. He doesn't look as though he's too skinny. So he's definitely taken to being a solitary cat very, very well. Now, we are going to try and reposition because he's gone behind us and through a big, thick bush. I wonder where he's off to because this is exactly the same way he got here. He walked in the exact same route. So I think maybe he's going to head now down towards Twin Dams. So let's see. He's busy bounding away through the long grass, as Hosanna often does. Now it's quite interesting that every time that I've seen him here and he comes this way, he takes this little shortcut and then he's going to pop out in front of us. And this is where we had him the other day where he was stalking that scrub hair and he got so close to the scrub hair and ended up missing it. I don't know why he actually didn't even jump towards the scrub hair, it was so close. Um, but he ended up kind of fluffing it and missing the scrub hair, but it's the same exact movement that he makes. Now, Lost him here somewhere, but he must be close by. Oh, there he is. Where are you going, Hasana? Now, while we try and keep up with this lip and see where he goes to, go back across to James and see what his plans are for the morning and see whether or not he's had any luck finding a spotted or rather large cat for that matter. My plans have not changed. We are approaching now Galago Pan and we're hoping that the leopard tracks that Herbert found uh, were on the end of a leopard that was walking extremely slowly and that it has taken two days to arrive at the Galago Pan and so with any luck we'll pick it up as it arrives there. Maybe. Maybe not. Well, it is a glorious morning. I'm most pleased to find that Hosanna is back and that he is unscathed from his fight with his daddy and quite possibly his sister and I suspect the tracks that Herbie had are hers and remember when she went missing, well not missing, but we hadn't seen her for a few days and Herbert and I went walking in here we found her uh, sort of lurking in amongst these drainage lines where it's almost impossible to go with the vehicle we had a lovely sighting of her on foot so she could easily be spending time in there, especially as the hyenas don't seem to be around that area, and nor do the lions. So we'll drive very slowly through here, and you know, quite often, in the last few days, I, you know, I've been in the tent. There's a big bird up there, David. I've been in the tent in the afternoons, and just as the sun's kind of gone down, it started to get dark. There's been an irritation from the birds. No, not that one, David. It's that vast thing sitting on the tree over there, and you see it there. There we are. <laughs> a 
<laughs> brown snake eagle, everyone. I'm quite impressed that you saw the minuscule thing that you filmed, David. I didn't know what that was. It was too small. All right, this one's now following the same path. See if you can track it. There it goes. And what I think you probably wouldn't have picked up as that bird flew was the alarm call of a number of birds in the understory as it flew past. Very nice. Hmm. Now the brown snake eagle, of course, is an eater of snakes, brown and otherwise, but it will also eat little birds, it will eat other reptiles, it will eat small mammals, like those mongoose. And so all small things must watch out when the brown snake eagle in his beady yellow eye is flying around the sky. You like how I did that, David? I didn't mean to, it just happened by mistake. It was a random rhyme. Alrighty. I've forgotten what I was waffling about before that. Okay, we'll pop around the corner here, see what we can find at the pan. While we do that, I believe that Jamie is uh, behaving much like the first little carnivore I showed you this morning. That is exactly what I'm doing, and I'm probably doing it for exactly the same reason that Hosanna is doing it. I'm basking. I'm basking in the sun on a termite mound. Unfortunately, it's not an active termite mound. That's what I was hoping, because at this time of year, you can really feel the heat coming up from the vents, and actually finding yourself a nice place like this, it's basically like having underfloor heating, which is amazing, because that's what a termite mount is. It's a ventilation system, so all of the hot air from inside the termite mount itself. And remember that this is just the tip of the iceberg. What you're seeing is just a small portion of this entire termite colony's home. The rest of it's underground. And they create these chimneys to control the internal temperature, so to let the hot air out. Now usually, sitting here is a really good idea because it's nice and warm, but unfortunately the termites are not around in this particular termite mound. Sometimes you see hornbills doing it as well. Hornbills go and they sit on the entrance to the chimney and they sit there in the freezing cold and you can see on a really cold morning you can actually see the steam rising. It's not that cold this morning but it is a really useful trick to warm up and it's great for guests to show them how much heat is actually being released by the termite mound itself. And they've got to keep it at a constant temperature. Right, I'm not going to be lazy the whole morning, I promise. They've got to keep it at a constant temperature because they're farming fungus below the surface of the soil. The fungus helps to break down the plant material that they bring it. And to farm it, they have to sort of cultivate it at a certain optimum temperature, which is somewhere around the mid-30s in centigrade. Can't get too hot or else the fungus won't survive. So the termites are very cleverly worked out a ventilation system that would make most engineers very jealous. I've just spotted something. Uh, it's caused me to get up and relinquish my warm sunny spot and to go walking through the dewy grass. Seen lots of it around. This, that looks a little bit like wild cotton. This is milkweed. Milkweed is the very toxic plant that monarch butterfly caterpillars feed off. Obviously it explodes like this when it's time for the seeds to disperse. It has a colloquial South African name in Afrikaans um, that describes the... It's a very, very descriptive name for the way in which the fruits form, but I'm not going to tell you any more about that because I'm going to send you back across to Hosanna, who I'm sure is looking beautiful this morning. He is indeed. He's just come up onto a little fallen log and he is posing perfectly. And he's busy scratching, getting those claws nice and sharp, generally being a little hooligan. And 
now back into the long grass we go. So every now and then he's giving us these beautiful visuals where he jumps up onto something and other than that he seems to be moving quite quickly through the grass and it's been interesting to watch him because Hosanna is probably one of the most relaxed leopards that I've dealt with as a small young male and generally young males can be quite shy but he's to this morning seems a little bit sort of wary. He's walking quite quickly away from the vehicle when it starts and then he starts to kind of calm down once it follows him for a little bit but he's showing sort of more and more that he's aware of the fact that he's now under sort of threat that mom is not around you can see that he's a little bit more wary of what's going on around him and that's probably because of that it's the incident he had with Tingana he knows now that Tingana is starting to see him in a bit of a different light it's no longer sort of this male leopard that's tolerant of his presence he's now getting into a situation where Tingana is starting to see him as more of a threat and so that's why he'll be a little bit more cautious about what's going on and keep his distance from certain things like the vehicles um, just in case they come out now I'm going to try and see if we can't find a better place because he's gone behind a tree there as you can see and let's just try to see if we can't position ourselves slightly better but that was very nice of him to go on this big fallen log here it was perfect perfect place with that morning sunshine on his golden coat so so special now I'm hoping because we are moving slowly in a southeasterly direction it would be nice if he joins up with Shongile Try and negotiate this big thicket. So you can see he's a little bit kind of wary. He keeps trotting off a little bit as we get sort of alongside him, which means he's kind of a little bit nervous of the car at this stage. I don't want to push him too much. I'm just going to give him a bit of space and see where he goes to. He's just gone behind this little tree area here. There you can see him through the thicket. I wonder where he's going to head from here. I was hoping that he was going to head a little bit more sort of east of where we are and maybe try and see if he finds little Shongile. It would be nice to see the two of them together again. But I don't think he actually knows where he wants to go. He's kind of trotting about everywhere and he's looking into all the trees and I think he's going to settle there. So let's try and see if we can't get ourselves into a place where we can actually see him. So, Kim, you're wondering if Hosanna would be making big kills yet? Well, yes, indeed. He killed an Impala a few days ago, close to Voyotela camp. And then he's also, we know, it's killed one or two Impalas in Little Gauri. So he's made quite a number of kills at this stage. And so he's just fine. He'll be making quite large kills. I believe the one kill that he made in Little Gauri was an adult male Impala. So that's very, very good for him. And if he's already started to get this technique where he's catching impalas, he's going to be just fine. So he's big and strong enough now to pull down those sort of sized animals in comparison to Shongila, who's still a little bit smaller. She struggles a bit to be able to pull down something of that size. So he is just fine. And you can see he looks in perfect condition. He's been without his mom now for it's over two months, and yet he's still perfect. He's got healthy body mass he's not in any way skinny you can see his neck is growing so he's doing just fine like I say he's taken to this single life and looking after himself like a duck to water and he's done really really well so it's good to see that his mom obviously taught him very well so the dear watcher are you wondering how much longer until he mates well that's dependent on where he ends up and how life goes for Hosanna if, if he gets pushed out of this area and ends up being a nomadic male for a while he can go until even six seven years old before he's able to mate um, but if we look at sort of quarantine and Kunyuma and and Shivambalana they all sort of manage to get a territory fairly young and we're already mating by about four and a half five years so he's still got quite a while to go you must remember that Hosanna now is only about I think he's about just over 16 months 17 months I forget where we are now we're in May so 17 months um, so he's still a young male he's still got probably about two years to go before he's actually big enough to start challenging and take over any mating rights so it's not going to be any time soon but we will see where he ends up and how he ends up going and whether or not he can find himself a territory in this area that he is able to settle quite quickly or if he's going to have to be quite nomadic and end up quite far away now we're going to try and see if i can't reposition so we can see his face 
without all these big grass stalks. And while we do that, I believe James has got something else that is glistening in the sunshine that he would like to show you. I do have something else sitting in the sunshine, everybody. It's me. <laughs> but that's not really what I came here to show you. We came towards the hyena den on Gallagher Shortcut and we were, our progress was arrested somewhat by this bark spider which is doing precisely what the bark spider yesterday did and that is build its web during the morning. Very unusual. Now it's gone to the middle and what's interesting is I did a little bit of reading on the spiders yesterday and I accused the bark spider yesterday of leaving its web incomplete. You can see that little section there that looks incomplete. But many spiders will leave that gap there purposely. I'm not sure why, but they leave it there as a sort of gap, if you like. And uh, so I think that this bark spider has just completed this web. It is the most wonderful net. Now, well, there are some very irritated Franklins behind us, and they've been shouting for some time. And I just want to go, I want to reverse again. We, we do want to go and check out this hyena den again, but I just want to see if there isn't something coming wandering down the road here. We had a very clever thought from somebody yesterday who said, oh, sorry, David, that's not what they said. They said, um, is it possible that the bark spider is constructing its web now because of the full moon and so perhaps it's getting a little confused by what's day and what's not and I thought that was a really good thought. David, is there a leopard coming down the road? I think it's worth just popping up the road there quickly. We will go back in there, although I don't see any hyena tracks around and I don't want to destroy that web. Right, so we're just going to go to the bend here, we'll switch off and we'll have a listen. I can hear the Frankolin. Maybe it was a snook, David. There it is, the Franklin. You should be able to get it now. You see it there? It's just above the bush, next to the dead tree. Yep, that's the one. Go up a bit. Uh, left. No, no, left. Middle of frame. Up a bit. There you go. Hmm. Oh, I can't see any tracks on the road, and naturally it is now no longer terrified. Could have been a snake, could have been a brown snake eagle flying overhead. And there's another Franklin looking chilled to the max over there, Dave. Mm. You see it there? No, I don't. It's just over there, David. Look where I'm pointing, man. <laughs> God. There it is. A the crested Franklin, everybody. One of four Franklin species that we get here. Jamie Patterson, unlike me, has managed to find some tracks. Well, I mean, they're not leopard tracks and they're not actually the tracks that I've been searching for this morning. But that's the one advantage of walking along a road is that it gives you a sort of nice up close and personal view of different types of smaller tracks, especially when it comes to the nocturnal creatures and especially if you are walking along the road first thing in the morning before anyone else has driven around here. So this particular track is an interesting one and I'll explain to you exactly why it's so interesting because it's a really nice lesson in taking in 
everything around the track as well because it's not tracking is not just about the footprint or the print in the sand it's about the evidence around it now this particular animal has walked here at night and we know that just because i can see how fresh and clear the outline is and it's got a very interesting track it's the same size as a civet track but much more elongated and you can actually see not very clearly i'll try and find you a clearer example but you can actually see where the claws are in its toes one two three four and most importantly i was always taught and i know different people have different approaches the back pad is asymmetrical so one lobe kind of extends out past the other and this is a solitary creature you don't see any sign of any other ones wandering about and it is in fact a white-tailed mongoose that's walked along this road and wandered up and down and it's what's interesting about it is you can learn about the animal's behavior based on their tracks so if you don't necessarily see the creature but you observe the way that their tracks go and the way that this mongoose has veered on and off the road obviously searching for insects as it goes along um, that gives you a really nice idea of what this mongoose was doing and how they behave at night now, all mongoose have asymmetrical back pads it's one of those defining features and when you're looking at something like a dwarf mongoose track that becomes very important because a dwarf mongoose track could look exactly like a squirrel track in thick sand but then again observing everything around the track as well you generally don't get 13 squirrels all running together in the same direction and then backwards and forwards and greeting each other in the way that you might with a dwarf mongoose now that also tells you a great deal and you can learn about the behavior from the tracks and you can learn about the tracks from what you know about their behavior. Now that's just an interesting little lesson. If I find any more interesting tracks, the one thing I haven't found is hyena tracks, which is interesting. Now Kat, you want to know how can I tell if a track is fresh? You know, funnily enough, that's one of the reasons why it's important not just to know what a track of an elephant, a lion, and a leopard look like, and why it's important to know some of the smaller things as well and their behavior. Now, there's a couple of different ways that you can tell a track is fresh. One is if you're not sure, particularly in thick sand, let's go, to, let's go a little bit further ahead to the sun so that I can demonstrate this properly. So here's our, here's our mongoose tracks over here. Still walking along the road. Um, or, you know, could just vanish as soon as I try to point one out. And the last one I've got is over here. Here's our mongoose tracks, and you can actually... Oh, Ferg, you can see the claws really clearly here. Here's a little indentation of the claws. So now, we're looking at a type of substrate that the track is in. It's quite sandy, not thick sand, not fine sand, it's somewhere in between. But see how clearly and crisply you can see the outline of the track how individual toes are really, really, really very clear. Now, after a while, that starts to blur because the wind starts to blow, there's things blowing about. So if I do this, see? That's a track, especially if you know it's a windy day, that's a track that has now become 12 hours old, admittedly somewhat sped up by me blowing on it but if you're not sure about how clear a track is going to be in a certain type of sand stand next to it so if I stand there I can see how clearly the outline of the track of my shoe is and how crisp and clear the details are and that gives me an idea if I compare it to the track that I'm looking at it'll give me a nice idea as to how fresh it is and then there's other little tracks other little indicators that will tell you how fresh something is. Tracks of a mouse, tracks of a frog, tracks of a bird. Anything that crosses over those tracks, if you know how that animal behaves, you can start to gauge. So if I've got a set of leopard tracks walking along a road, and I'm not quite sure how fresh they are, but now I see it's first thing in the morning and there's dove tracks walking over them. I know those doves aren't walking on the road until the sun is out and they can start to forage on the ground. So then those leopard tracks are probably from before the morning, probably from the night before, maybe even older, depending on how old the dove tracks are. So it's a, it's a calculation more than anything else. Look at this road network. 
This is so cool. This is the N, this is the N1, Ferg. This is definitely the busier highway. That's the N1 over there. That's one of our national motorways for the ants. You can see they've actually dug out a trail. So that's the busiest highway. And then this is the Galulis interchange over here where the road networks meet. That's the road, what's the road that leads down to the coast, down to Durban? N3. N3, there we go, there goes the N3 and the N12 over there. Where's the Harry Smith... Uh... <laughs> Where's the Harry Smith Wimpy? Yeah, I was going to say Nando's. Okay, I mean, yeah, more about <laughs> Nando's. Um, Harry Smith Wimpy's over... No, there we go, that's where they've all congregated, that's Bergville. Right, sorry Alice, I got so distracted that I wasn't quite listening to what I was going to do. I think I'm sending you over to James. Let's go and see how his morning is treating him. Here are some arrow-marked babblers. <laughs> trying to think of something else to say about them. <laughs> They are not babbling, they are hopping. They are very good hoppers, are the arrow mark babblers. Looking for insects. We'll roll, oh, there's another one, good reef, David, look at that. Our cup, look at how well it hops. See that? It is an excellent hopper. You can't see its red eyes, it's got very nice red eyes with little yellow bits in the middle. See if we can't get a little bit closer. We found no tracks, I'm afraid. But that's okay. It's a glorious morning. We'll just keep heading towards Beefles Hook Dam, where undoubtedly there will be one or two hippo. Did you hear that one? There, they're babbling now, David. Let me move a little bit forward for you. They're in that tree, in the Combretum Herreroense tree. Ah, enjoying the sun sharpening their beaks, cleaning their beaks, fishing out the odd insect that's there. there you can, they really have got remarkable eyes. I wasn't being sarcastic about that at all. They sort of see them there. Yeah. Well, that was a nice sighting of Arimong Babblers, wasn't it, David? Hmm, good. Let's continue. So we've come up onto the northern boundary, and if you are perhaps a new viewer, we are unable to go to the left-hand side of your screen. This is the where we have to stop, but the animals, of course, can come and go as they please. And I suspect that lion that was very cleverly spotted by the zoomie on the dam wall uh, yesterday evening has probably gone in here, or gone to the south. And Juma very much at the moment seems to be some kind of... Uh, one hesitates to use the term transition zone, but uh, it is... There's a lot of activity from the lions, especially. At night, they come on, they sort of shout and scream, and then they back off during the rest, during the rest of the night. And they go north into Buffel's Hook, or they go south into Little Gari. There's something on the top of the hill there. But it is a bush, everybody, and a bush is not nearly as important as the first kill of the morning. A kill that is still touch and go. This is absolutely incredible. The struggle of life and death out here can take the smallest of forms. In this case, the smallest mantis I've ever seen. I think it's a mantis. It's so tiny, I can actually barely focus on it and it's caught an ant, and the ant is frantically struggling. I can't believe this drama of life and death is playing out on my sleeve. I have never ever seen a mantis this small. Oh, goodness. Hold on, let me, sorry, Ferg, let me. It's got it, it's struggling. The ant is pulling really hard. It almost looks like a really tiny flower mantis, but I don't think so. Please send through your screenshots, because I want to see if one of the other guides has ever seen one of these before, because I haven't. This 
is such a remarkable creature. This ant has been struggling. I think the struggle's over. I can't really see, Ferg. Is it over? Mm. Or is that ant still moving? Still giving it a go. Still trying to get away. One of those little ants that we were looking at earlier obviously had a got kidnapped off the highway and is now being consumed by this mantis. Fierce, fierce predators gripped in its front claws with their jagged edges that when we pick up big mantises, we even we feel piercing into our skin. And it's now using powerful jaws to bite into the ant itself. And I think that's just, no, it's still going. This poor ant, it's still alive. Should we sit down, Ferg, so that we're both a bit more, or at least I'm a bit more stable. I don't want to shake the way through this, but this is so dramatic. I feel as though Ferg and myself should sit down and actually watch it. This is the prettiest mantis I've ever seen. And I've seen some pretty mantises. Okay, I'll just keep my, my wrist angled at a really beautiful angle. It's really comfy. Look at this. You'll have to let me know what's going on there because I can't see now. I've got the back end of the mantis. This is so cool. Look at it, black head, white body, upturned abdomen, and one very desperate ant that is fighting for its life. At one point, I really thought it was gonna get away. I really, really did. It was so close and the mantis was desperately grappling with it and grasping at it. And it almost got half of its body free. And ants, of course, are unbelievably strong for their body size, but so are mantises. Is this ant still struggling? Now, Siberia Zumi, you say that it is a boxer mantis. A boxer mantis. What a brilliant name, because they do really box, don't they? With those powerful front legs. I wish it would end this poor ant's experience. I wish I could have seen the moment when this mantis grabbed this ant. It would have been amazing to witness. These are the kind of things that you see on walk that you don't ever, ever spot from a vehicle. If you were able to spot this from a vehicle, you'd be some kind of superhero. You'd have some kind of special, extra special vision. It's tiny. It's the size of a grass seed. This is awesome. My stomach's rumbling away which is terrible because it's not the sight of the mantis eating an ant is making me particularly hungry. Yeah. I have a taste for ants. So. I, I can't say I have a taste for ants. Speak to James about having a taste for ants. He understands maybe better. I haven't been all that into ants for most of my life. Can't speak for my early childhood. It's amazing it's antenna fluttering away like that. That's what also fascinates me. What is it... Why are they constantly moving like that? What vibrations are they picking up? Is it because I'm speaking around it? I think that's it. I think the ant is dead. I think that's the end of the... No, I still... I think I can still see the ant's leg moving. A long and protracted struggle. I think Mantis is pretty... He's satisfied he's done the job. Uh, he does look satisfied that he's done the job. Now, now it's breakfast time. The ant is twitching. The ant is twitching, but also bear in mind that the structure of insects' bodies are different. So they don't have, yes, they have a central ganglion around their face, but they don't have a brain like we have a brain. And they have ganglions, so a collection of nerves, all the way along their bodies. So even when an insect is technically dead, the sort of the functioning parts of it around its face are, are, are dead and gone, the rest of the body could still transmit nerve, scent, nerve impulses, which is one of the reasons why if a mantis is mating, and of course they have that famous reputation for killing their mates, the females often eat the male and eat it head first, but that's one of the reasons why the, the male can continue to mate with the female without his head. Nearly said something terrible. I said, caught myself in time.
Oh, Chris, it's entirely possible that the ant was carrying an egg sac. I have seen a few ants this morning already carrying egg sacs. So it's, it's entirely possible. I haven't had a chance to actually properly look, and bear in mind I'm looking at it from a different perspective to you, but it's entire, I, I, there's distinct possibility that that's what it was doing. I'll have a look around where I found them, because they were initially on a blade of grass, and then I thought that I'd lost them and then discovered it on my sleeve. So I'll have a look around and see if there's any other ants. Ants? There's definitely no ants here. Any other ants? moving eggs around. That would also make it more vulnerable to an attack of a mantis. And of course for the mantis, that's a two for one deal because the egg carries plenty of nutrition as well. This is crazy. The mantis looks pretty happy and is now feeding. You can even see those powerful front legs. Now Megan, you want to know if it poisons the ant at all. No, it didn't. There's no poison involved. This was pure physical crushing, pure physical strength. It grabbed it with its front legs, which are phenomenally strong and jagged on the inside. And then it basically crushed its head and crushed its body with its jaws. I think this is the stablest I've ever been. Glad I didn't have too much coffee this morning created a tripod with my own elbow. I want to watch too. I want to see what you're seeing. I want, I want to see it close up. And I think that's exactly what I'm going to do. Oh, except the mantis is now carrying off its prize. Well, we have the end point of our kill and time to feed. Let's go and find out whether Hassan has done any more hunting. Well, we haven't seen him get anywhere near anything just yet. He is definitely watching and listening and looking around, but so far, no luck for little Hassan. He's got no meal to show for anything. He's been chased around by a few birds, and you can hear the rollers are squeaking at him and a few Franklins have shouted at him, but other than that, he's been... and now the Hornbills are also going. But other than that, he's just been sort of very circumspect, and he's been walking around and listening and looking and smelling, and just trying to kind of see what's going on around him. He hasn't really bumped into anything of substance, and so I'm sure as time goes and he starts to find what he's looking for, if he sees maybe some Impalas or a Daika or something like that, then he will definitely start going into a lot more of a hunting mode. Earlier he was trying to stalk some Franklins but got hopelessly nowhere near them. They were far and they saw him and lots of squawking and squeaking as he bounded after them but really had no shot. But you can see how difficult they can be to find. Look at that camouflage there. Absolutely amazing. So Douglas, you're wondering how good a leopard's eyesight is. Well, it's very good. It's much like us. They have binocular vision so the eyes are in the front of the head and they have very large eyes so they're able to pull in a lot of light which means that they see very very well at night and their eyesight is definitely better than what ours is so they don't see in nearly the same spectrum of colors though because they've sacrificed cells in their eyes to be able to see better at night so we have two types of cells in our eyes we have rods and cones and cones are the color cells so those are the cells that will pick up color and the rods are light cells and so as these animals move, well these leopards and us and we have sort of balances of the two with leopards and lions they tend to have very 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 few cone cells and that ends up with them being able to see much better at night but not so well um, well, not so well in terms of colour. Now we're going to try and see if we can't find a better place to park. As you can see, it's quite dense and thick behind me here. And while we do that, let's go and see what James is up to with some rather large aquatic animals. <laughs> Hello everybody. Sorry, David and I were just having a conversation because he was uh, waving at the screen, but he was actually just trying to remove a spider web which would have obscured your view of the hippopotami here at Bivazuk Dam. Now, I've come to Bivazuk Dam not so much to see these hippo because I feel like we've sort of done these hippo to death over the last few days, but because <laughs> there were reports, of course, from Herberto yesterday, and uh, David reminded me of these, of a mating pair of leopards, well, 
the tracks anyway around this area and so it's worth us coming around seeing if we can hear the terrifying sound of uh, leopards in flagrante delicto but I hear nothing like that I hear just the sweet trilling noises of robins in the distance a couple of canaries and a few what else? Ah, a couple of three-banded plovers. Now, there is a three-banded plover on the ground there. That is the three-banded plover. Now, there are alarm-calling impala down to the south of the reserve, which was, of course, nowhere near where we are. And uh, they're going to just check if Shongile isn't in that area. So just in case they don't find her, I thought I must just give you that update. So it looks like she is around. David, quickly, there's a huge amount of action going on. A hippo just stuck its back out of the water. Yo. Do people say this in other parts of the world? Do people go, shoo? Or was it a South African thing? What a lot of action. It means, my goodness, good gracious me. Ah, now, there has been, I've, well, there have been reports of mating hippopotami in this dam. And certainly that might be what's going on here. But, you know, it's very difficult to tell, of course, on account of them being under the water. And also very difficult to tell who's male and who's female. And I think that one, the male, if it is a male behind there, is just a little bit nervous. And Jamie yesterday called a terrapin a hippo, and I thought that was quite funny. But if you can see how that mistake was made, if you go up to the one behind there and you just see that little bit of something sticking up and the light is reflecting off the surface of the water, it's very easy to call a hippopotamus a terrapin or indeed a crocodile. I'm just going to quickly scan the shores of the dam and then we're going to move on. I don't see the lipids. And as Jamie has just pointed out, and she's absolutely correct, and I mean, this is the least of the, mis mis uh, can <laughs> the misinformation I've given. She said, I once called a hippo skull, at least a warthog skull, a hippo skull. I absolutely did. It was one of the more embarrassing moments of my life. Um, and it was, you know, we try not to embarrass each other. Well, sort of. And uh, Brent was left with no option but to embarrass me live because it was such a ridiculous untruth that I had told by mistake that he was left with no option but to correct me. So yes, she makes a very good point there. Um, you know, David, as the old saying goes, I think it was, um, I think it may have been uh, the good Lord himself who said this. He said, uh, you know, judge not the speck in someone else's eye when you have a plank in your own. Yes. And there is a large plank in my eye. Planks, but rather of leopards and where we might find them. Ooh, what is that? Is that a derve? I think it is a derve. It is a derve. Emerald spotted wood derve. Now I think our signal is not good, so we're going to move along here, see if we can find tracks of the mating pair. In the meantime, Tristan is still with the little chief. So, we are just trying to crash through the bush a little bit to try and catch up with Hosano, who's now run up onto a termite mound. So he's found himself a beautiful spot with beautiful morning light and it really is a spectacular scene to see him up on his termite mound. So there he is, 
and he's still now facing south of us and I'm sure that's because there were impalas that were alarm calling just to the south of us and we had Shungile's tracks a little bit earlier right where we are now so I wonder if she's not around here as well wouldn't it be fantastic to see the two of them come together but isn't that beautiful in amongst the long grass of the termite mound he just looks so elegant up there you can see he's watching the comings and goings of some of the other vehicles and just seeing what's happening. Now I'm quite surprised he walked straight past a male impala. He didn't even blink at it. I don't know if he spotted it but he seems to be more enthralled with these impalas that were alarm calling south of us. So I wonder if he knows that there's maybe something else afoot and maybe another leopard is close by and in this area and that's why he's kind of checking around and seeing and facing in that direction. You can see his ears are moving around quite a bit. He's trying to work out exactly what's going on and whether or not it would be safe for him to head in that area. Now like I say the tracks that I did have were for a female leopard which would have been pretty much I'm sure for Shungile. They were small tracks so I'm sure it's his sister that's been causing the noise to be made. Isn't he beautiful? Up on his mound. You are looking very regal, my boy. You're starting to grow and fit into those ears and paws and body. And I was looking at his tracks just now when we were crossing the road because often with tracks and tracking, we find tracks very regularly and it's difficult to know exactly who it is unless you can actually see them putting their foot down and you then look at the track quite carefully. And he's just seeing how big his foot actually is. It's quite amazing. It's not too far behind Tingana these days. He still doesn't quite have the same size foot, but he's getting there. It's, it's definitely gotten much bigger and his tracks do now resemble a male leopard rather than a sort of big female. So Kirk, he's in Tingana's territory. That's where he moves around. Tingana was, was what we, th well, we think fathered these cubs and um, so he moves around within that territory because when he was a tiny cub this would have been where Karula hung around and Tingana would have made sure that he protected this area so that these cubs would be protected. So that's where he is now. Um, we do sometimes find that Mvula will move around in these areas but he's no longer really a territorial male. He's now nomadic so it's more Tingana's territory than anything else. And he hasn't, Hosanna hasn't drifted outside of that yet. We've only really seen him around these sort of natal areas where he was born. He hasn't started making any sort of progress and moving out and around and into other areas and that's very very important that he doesn't because at the age that he is he can't defend himself against a really big male he just doesn't have the techniques he doesn't have the experience he also just doesn't have the size and so he needs to stay in this area where kind of Tingana knows him and won't see him as too much of a threat just yet but will still sort of provide some sort of protection by being able to push um, other um, leopards away and, and Hosanna can then fly under the radar and that's why you'll find that he won't vocalize, he won't scent mark, if he does urinate it will just be in a bush somewhere, he's not going to actually use his back legs and, and actually scrape and urinate like that. Um, so he's going to try and fly under the radar as much as possible until he gets a little bit late, uh, older, until he gets to about four or five years old and that's when he'll start to then actually push for dominance and mating. But isn't that beautiful with all the grass? Absolutely amazing. So Donna, you're wondering if he's always had that little notch in the top of his ear. Well, Donna, I'm actually not sure. I was just looking at that myself and wondering the same thing. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of viewers out there that will definitely know. So if you do know, hashtag Safari Live, and you can help us out and let us know if Hassan has always had his little notch in his left ear. And it's, it's interesting because it doesn't look like a cut or anything like that. It just looks like the shape of the ear is slightly different on the edge there. You can see it looks like there's a little piece missing out that's quite old it hasn't that's definitely healed so yes it must have been there for a while it's definitely not something that's very new but I've actually never noticed it before I was just looking at the exact same thing in that shot and wondering whether or not that notch is new or not but now that I can see with the ear kind of moving towards us you can see there's no sort of fresh sign of blood or scabbing so I would imagine that's quite an old nick and has been there for quite some time you can see how he's watching around from where he is now he's got the perfect sort of vantage point to see what's going on he's on a very tall 
termite mound and from up there he'll be able to watch over this area and to see if there's any sign of potential prey animals or any other leopards that could be moving around and you can see now he's going back down and I wonder if he hasn't spotted that male impala that I was referring to earlier I think maybe he missed it because he's looking in the same direction where that male impala was and is now heading back the way he came so I wonder if he's not going to maybe try and head in that direction although it seems like he's now changed again and going around the side of the mound might be a bit hot on top there the sun has come out and it is starting to get a little bit warm so maybe he's going to try and see if he can't find some shade so I think what we'll try to do is try and just see if we can't move and find ourselves a better position I'm just trying to see which way he goes because I can see some grass moving oh he's back on top of his mount what are you doing Hosanna? Well, maybe he just decided to go on a walkabout of the mound and just explore this sort of castle that he's on He's back exactly where he started again. I wonder if he wasn't trying to find a place to lie down in the shade and there just wasn't a comfy spot down further down and he's now going to find somewhere else to lie and show us his bum. So I'm going to just move so that we can actually see something other than his spotted little tail. Now, while we try and reposition and get ourselves into a more friendly place, I believe Jamie's still out and about and on foot and looking around for all the small things. So let's go see where she is and what she's doing. The small things and the big things. We're on Zoe's road checking for hyena tracks and weirdly completely in sort of opposition to what we've been experiencing recently. There's not a single hyena track to be found. But my heart's still beating fast from the excitement of that really truly amazing mantis sighting. Oh, we've spoken about the big things. There's a kudu in here that I want to try and show you. I, kudu are difficult on foot. They're so shy. But he's just gone here. It's a magnificent big bull. Oh, I'll come to why I'm going oh in a moment. No, I think he's disappeared already. Oh, there we go. There's a female looking at us. I don't know if you can see it there, Ferg. Can you see it? Not really. She might have ducked away. You've got her. Brilliant. Well done. Obviously, getting close to the antelope on foot is not always an easy thing. The Nyala are pretty relaxed, but Kudu are very, very shy, and they like to disappear. And the fact that we've even managed to get her to stay still is fantastic. You can see her looking at us with those massive ears, both pointed straight at us. Okay, let me show you why I said ooh. <laughs> it's not hard to see why I said ooh. It's, um, it's very clearly in the middle of the road kind of an ooh. That is very fresh. So I noticed his tracks a while back, the bull elephant that's walked along this road. So now the question is when has he walked along this road and how fresh is this? Well, look at how wet this dung is. This is really very new. There's no heat on the top. So it's cooled down, but it's a cool morning. And if we, if we go into the center of this pile of dung, it's cool in the middle. Okay. So it's not that warm, it's not that fresh. And the bull elephant, when you're trying to track him down, this bull could have walked, it could have covered two kilometers in the time it's taken me to sit and actually examine that dung. It's a slight exaggeration, but tracking a bull elephant when it's on a mission can be a difficult thing. Fortunately, though, he's not on a mission. He's stopped and he's had some food, been eating bush willow. You can see the remains of them strewn along the road and some grass as well. And just for our new viewers, obviously we've got very fresh wet dung and you've noticed me touching it. I will wash my hands afterwards. I will never ever do this with predator scat, not even old predator scat, but herbivore dung, I have never ever got sick from it. Look, maybe I think our constitutions at this point are relatively robust, but I will be washing my hands afterwards before I 
go and eat some breakfast. I'm going to see if I can track this elephant bull down. Maybe we get lucky and he hasn't moved off too far. And speaking of creatures moving off, let's go and see whether or not Hassan has made his way any closer to the boundary. Well, Jamie, he hasn't. He's now found himself a beautiful termite mound to just lie and watch the world go by. And he's looking ever. So I think that there might be, Shungilia might be on her way back this way. And maybe that's why he's lying um, at on top of this mound and just watching what's going on. Maybe trying to see whether this is indeed his sister or maybe a different leopard that could be approaching. So he's found himself in the perfect place. Now, Jamie's saying she's going to be tracking elephants. Well, she was the elephant whisperer yesterday, so I'm hoping that she will be able to find them. I saw quite fresh tracks around Trias Dam area as well heading sort of northwards, so maybe she, those are the same tracks that she's on and she'll have some luck finding them. But isn't that beautiful? So you can see he's starting to be, get a little bit sleepy now, his eyes are starting to close and it's this typical sort of winter phase that we go through with, with cats. They often are like this, they move around in the early hours of the morning and then as that sun starts to get warm they tend to lie and just kind of absorb a bit of warmth and sunshine before they then start finding some shade and you'll often find the cats on top of mounds like this just watching but he is so so beautiful he's got the most amazing eyes and face so Megan this is a question that I've been asked many times um, throughout my guiding career and it's whether or not Hosanna or a individual leopard would recognize our voices or our smells. Well, I, I would imagine that they definitely recognize some of the sounds that we make. I don't know if they recognize, recognize each individual as a sort of different entity, but I would imagine with the, the sense of hearing that they have that they would be able to differentiate between all of our voices and know that certain voices are certain individuals. But the thing is, is that if you look at Hosanna, the first time I ever saw him, he would never have known who I was, but yet his sort of demeanor was still the same. So he didn't react any differently to me as he would to, well, me the first time as he does to me now after spending quite a bit of time with him. So I think they do recognize the sort of smells and, and the sounds associated with vehicles, but whether they differentiate that from each individual is debatable. It's, it's possible, and, and I, given that they, their senses are so good, I would imagine that they can but they seem to not show too many different reactions to different people. Um, you know, I've watched Hosanna and I've seen now three different vehicles coming in and his behavior hasn't really changed across those three different vehicles and it's not like he's drifted closer to any sort of in particular person. So I would imagine that they can kind of differentiate but they don't sort of apply a different behavior around that unless somebody's done something really negative to them. So if let's say I had to drive now up into the mound and chase him and do all of those kind of things then I think over time he would be able to recognize my sort of voice and the sound of Jigger and he would know that that's something he needs to be scared of but nowadays you know for his, in his lifetime he's been treated with respect by multiple guides and so he's pretty relaxed with vehicles and the sounds of most of the voices that he hears. It's interesting though because if we sort of apply it to other animals there used to be a rhino in this area called Stompy and, oh not Stompy, sorry, Skewhorn, and he used to have a particular hatred for one guide in, and nobody knew why and this guide asked him, did you ever have a sort of time where you chased him or anything like that and he said no and, but this time, every single time that guide would come down the road and his voice would be heard that Rhino would come charging straight towards him and try and horn his vehicle and with all the other guides he was very relaxed, you would be able to spend lots of time but with that particular guide, he used to get such trouble from that individual. So there must be a case of these animals recognizing something in us and our voices and knowing that that was a particularly sort of person that maybe in some stage had chased that rhino or had done something to cause that response. So I think they're a lot more intelligent than we give them credit for. So I would imagine that they do recognize us, but whether or not they apply a different behavior is still very much a debatable situation. But although Hosanna is still intent on watching, I wonder if he's not watching that male impala. Like I said earlier, there wasn't a male impala that was just off to our western side and seems like he's kind of watching in that direction. 
Maybe he's hoping that that male impala will get closer. The nice thing about being up on a mound like this, especially a very grassy mound, is that he's going to be quite well camouflaged from up there. And if something like an impala came close, he would be able to then get right down and drop his head, and he would be very difficult to see him. That coupled with the fact that there is a sl slight breeze that is blowing this morning, and so being up on the mound means that he would be able to stay out of that sort of wind that would be drifting towards the impala and so it would be a little bit higher than where the impala is and the impala then shouldn't actually pick up his scent and he'll be able to then stalk from up there so it's a good place for him to be not only can he see what's going on around him but he can also pick up if the animal does come close it's a good place to launch an attack from but isn't he beautiful look at that it's amazing when he kind of looks around to us and you lock eyes with him. It's such a special feeling. So Adele in the UK, you're wondering if there are any other specific markings that we can use to identify Hosanna. Now, for me, Hosanna has just a face that I recognize. He's got that sort of pink and black nose, which will change and we've got that nick out of the left ear and he's, I know he's got three spots on his right cheek I'm not sure about his left so I'm sure some of the viewers out there will be able to help us with his spot pattern on the left side it's funny because for us I don't often look at markings because we often see these leopards enough that it's almost like when you see your dog you just know who it is and so it's like that with for me anyway I know some of the other guides it's a bit different and they'll use spot patterns but for me, it's just kind of the general look of the animal, the size, the area that we're in, um, and certain facial features that will tell me who it is. And Hassan has kind of got that very boxed face for me, and he's got that little pink nose and rather large ears. And there's really no other young male leopard that would hang around in this area at the moment, and that's what I use. But they definitely will be key identifying features, and I know a lot of the viewers out there spend a lot of time putting together all the ID kits and showing us all the different markings that they have. I know there's some that do it with the hyenas as well. So I'm pretty sure that someone will be able to help us and tell us exactly what they use as a key IDing feature and what spots they like to use to identify Hosanna. But most of the time when we do sort of IDs of leopards and, and you use spot patterns, you mostly use the little spots above the whiskers. So right now those are obscured by the grass but there are a line of spots that sit just above the whisker line and on each side there will be a different number of them and on each individual they will be in a different place and so that's probably one of the best ways to ID leopards so you'll sometimes hear people saying that the leopard's got a 3-2 spot pattern which would basically mean that it would have three spots on its right side of its face and two spots on its left sp side of its face and so with Hosanna you can see very clearly those three spots now Oh, he's not turned his head away again, but and that grass is interfering with this whole exercise But he's basically has three that come from the nose above the whisker line and then on the left side He would have a certain number of spots and each of those will be arranged differently to any other animal um, Out here and that would be a way that you can ID them you Also use markings around the eye area and the cheek So, White Lady Ian, you say that he's got a ebony necklace, and I didn't catch the other part, Alice. You said something about under his eyes, but I couldn't catch something about a football. So, football player charcoal under his eyes. So, basically those dark black markings under his eye, and then a very, very, very distinct black necklace that comes around his chest area. So, those are the ones that you use to identify him, which... I can see. I, the thing about the black underneath the eyes is that that's a tough one to use because I have seen Tumba, in, who is the son of Tundi, another female that we see in this area, and he's also got very sort of dark liners under his eyes. But if that coupled with the sort of nick out of the ear and the three spots, then yes, I can see how you can use that for Hosanna. So that's a fair enough call. I'm sure there are others. Everybody seems to have their own sort of way of doing it, and some will recognize certain spots better than others so I'm sure there are other spots that he's got that make it only Hosanna
right, so we're going to stick with Hosanna because he's now coming down his mound and seems like he's going to carry on. And while we try and catch up with him and see what he's potentially going to go and look for, I believe James Hendry's got something that Hosanna would love to be seeing right here. Yes, we have Nyala. I think possibly a little bit uh, ambitious for young Hosanna, but you know, he's a young, young male, as we know. Young males are often a little over ambitious. It's rather a nice sight of him there, sort of backlit by the sun. Uh, very nice because it's more cryptic, isn't it, David? It's a little bit like an abstract piece of art where you're trying to make out what on earth the artist was trying to imply by his picture. And I feel that that is what we're getting from this shot here. A hidden Nyala with an oxpecker even more cryptically hidden in the bush. Now, we're on to advanced cryptic photography now. Uh, the, you will still be able to see the Nyala if you're particularly skilled at uh, sort of abstraction, abst abstract photography, which is what David's going for here. Can you still see it there, David? I'm not as skilled as you, you see. Let me just go a little bit forward. While I do that, I will tell you that we have had adult female leopard tracks around here, and I don't know who they belong to. One hesitates to use the K word, Karula, I mean, and I don't know, maybe it's possible, but I have consistently said to you that there must be female leopards in Biffleshook and Torchwood that we're just not fi we're just not seeing. And we're very close to the northeastern corner of our reserve of Juma, so it could just be a female that's come in from there, and Herbert reckons he has tracked a female around here that has come out of Torchwood, so I don't know. Then younger female leopard tracks on this road here, alarm calling squirrels everywhere, and of course, as you all know, when I have tracks, and when I have alarm calls, and when I have all the signs that a predator is in the area, you can be almost certain that I will not find the predator. <laughs> and that's the position in which we find ourselves now. But we did have one cryptic Nyala sighting, that was awesome, wasn't it, Dave? I took 74 pictures of it. I didn't really. It was invisible. Still a gorgeous morning. Right, the tracks of this animal are still going along the road here. They seem to be... No, this is a badger. All right, I'm not going to try and track the badger. And so while I am hacking around here, failing miserably, let's go back to he who has succeeded spectacularly. That's Tristan. Well, James, don't worry. I know perfectly well what it's like to hack around. I hacked around all of yesterday afternoon with no, not much luck, so I'm sure your luck will change and you will find what you're looking for. But as you can see, we've got a beautiful little butterfly here. So this is one of the Acrea species that is just sunning itself, trying to get nice and warm and get those wings dry from all the dew that would have settled and before it then starts to take off and flutter about for the day. But there is beauty everywhere in the bush this morning because as you can see behind that butterfly is the beautiful Hosanna who is just sitting and found himself a nice bit of shade now and I think that's him for the day. I think he's going to decide this is where he's going to rest for now. And so the butterfly has got the perfect view of a male leopard close to her. Now hopefully Hosanna doesn't jump on that butterfly because that will ruin that butterfly's day. But otherwise he is looking very, very, very sleepy indeed. I think that's the end. And I was wondering what he was going to get up to because where he's sitting now, unfortunately it's very difficult to see from where we are, but there is a termite mound that is covered in dwarf mongoose and they're all sitting sunning themselves. And I'm sure Hosanna could have seen them, but I think he's just not interested now. It's gotten quite warm. He's been moving around most of the morning, so I think it's time for him to rest and try again a little bit later in terms of hunting. I don't think he's going to be doing any of that anytime soon. It's amazing how he's found himself a little shady spot. I think earlier when he was on top of the mound, he came down to try and lie down and there wasn't any sun, I mean shade that he was comfortable in and that's why he went back onto the top of the mound. 
now he's sort of weighted it out and that shadow would have stretched slightly and he's now got himself the perfect place to spend the after well the morning at least as soon as the afternoon comes he's going to be slap bang in the middle of the sun but the morning it will be nice and cool up against that termite mound you can see those eyes are starting to shut and then you'll find the head will start to droop and nod a little bit and will then drop down what is interesting is you can see how the ears are still moving though so even though his eyes are closed and he's going into a period now where he's going to start resting he still is very aware of his environment and his ears are still working constantly to hear what's going on around him and you can see every now and then he does flick his ears and those are those biting flies that are coming out you can see them sort of hovering about his face on the right hand side there so those will be driving him a little bit crazy and once he lies down hopefully they'll ease up and leave him alone and go find a, another victim to go and worry hopefully it won't be us because a biting fly is a horrible little insect it's really is quite irritating they sort of hover around your face and then they land on you and they nip you and it's, it's sort of this slight stinging sensation it really is quite horrid so well then you want to say you want to know how many how long do leopards rest in a day well it depends on the individuals but um, most of the time you'll find that most leopards will rest for probably I would say at least 12 hours of a day um, they're not quite as lazy as what the lions are the lions can go up to about 20 hours a day but leopards you'll find are actually quite active animals they move around even in the heat of the day they move around at night um, but their sort of peak times that they move around is around sunset and sunrise and there will be period of rest in between so I'd probably say at most you'll find a leopard sleeping maybe 12 hours a day other than that, they are moving around and, and kind of seeing what's happening and finding the food that they need. Now just sniffing the breeze a little bit. You can see there's a bit of a rustle in the grass now from the wind. And that will carry little scent particles that he can pick up. You'll find every now and then he just lifts his nose and smells. But he's definitely getting very sleepy. Those eyes are starting to droop heavily now. And I reckon he's not long for this well, he's going to do a bit of daydreaming and going to lie down and have a really good rest for the hot part of the day. I think it's going to be one of those days, it's going to be very warm. The sun already feels very hot on our backs, so I'm pretty sure that it's going to be a warm day and a perfect day if you're a male leopard to find some shade and sleep. Now, I think what we're going to probably do is carry on and leave Hosanna to his nap. And there's some other vehicles that do want to come into this area, and so while we do that, I believe Jamie is playing about with trees. Well, I would love to actually play about with this tree. I think if I were a Hosanna, this is where I would want to be sleeping, up in the top in the boughs. A little bit of sun, a little bit of shade, be absolutely the perfect spot for where I'd want to be if I were a young male leopard searching for a good sleeping, sleeping patch for the day. But the chances of me getting to the top of this tree, or indeed climbing in any way, this particular tree, are next to nothing, without short of having a rope and some climbing equipment, I'm not sure that that would be entirely possible. Maybe James could do it. James is, of course, the champion tree climber, but I definitely can't. Now, we found our elephants, but they are in... There's a, a thicket, a Tamburti thicket, where Shadow likes to hide her cubs in the corner of Juma. And that's where the elephants are. And with the wind doing this this morning, round and round, uh, it's just it's not a good idea to try and follow them in there. And as Herbie said, they're probably going to stay there for the entire day because they have everything that they want there. There's plenty of food, there's some water. They're not, go they're not necessarily going to go anywhere. The big male that we were tracking has gone across the road and we're actually going to move away from these elephants because that area is just far too thick for us to make an approach and after yesterday which was an amazing sighting um, but it was purely in the hands of the elephants basically in terms of what what happened with yesterday's sighting um, I'm not definitely not going to go wandering in there after elephants I feel as though our luck is we were very lucky yesterday because that female was so relaxed. She did give us every sign that she was relaxed, which other, if she hadn't, I would have moved out immediately. But it was a really special moment, but also one of those moments where you think to yourself, the situation is in my control, but it's also in the control of the elephants. Now, I wanted to show you something really interesting that I've been seeing all morning, and of course, now that I want to show it to you, 
I can't find any. Do you remember months ago, the caterpillars that were targeting the silver cluster leaves? And they actually basically completely stripped the silver cluster leaves of their leaves. Well, the joy of these live safaris is that we get to follow the patterns and the flow of the bush for months and years at a time. And I learned something new. They're back again. Now that the silver cluster leaves have recovered, there's a second wave of caterpillars, same species. I think it was the African migrant, if I'm not very much mistaken. It's the same moth, uh, same butterfly species, same caterpillars. And it's basically because they, they really, in certain areas, they completely destroyed the silver cluster leaves, or at least took their leaves off. And now that they've recovered, you've got this second group of them. And I find that utterly fascinating. I'll try and find them to show you. You'll recognize them immediately, those of you that have been watching for a while. But it's absolutely amazing that nature plans things out that way, that everything gets utilized in a way that, that is balanced, that doesn't destroy the trees, that is uh, re renewable or, or, or sustainable in the way that resources are utilized, which of course is something that human beings are very bad at. We're not very good at the whole using resources sustainably. But it is fascinating the way that nature is able to do that and the balance that she strikes up. And it seems as though you get waves. You get the first, the silver cluster leaves being used, then the senners. The Waltherias are just, as James said, the gift that just keeps giving. But I find it amazing that they do balance things like that. I'm going to keep checking and see if I can't find you some more of them. Or maybe it's just in that one little section of the reserve. Let's just see what Herbie's circled here. What you got there, Herbs? Not sure. Should we go have a look? <laughs> Aha! Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. So the great Herbie is not sure. Okay. This is interesting. So, bird or reptile? Definitely not mammal, because the urea has been excreted as the solid white form. But look at that, look at that yellow and then the white. Wait, I need a, I need a more suitable crushing stick. Hold on. There we go. Oh, this is so solid. Oh, that is interesting. I definitely don't want to touch it with my fingers. That's the urea part, the white part. That's because birds and reptiles don't urinate. They excrete their excess urea in a solid form. It's a great way of saving water. What is that? Is that just, <laughs> it looks like, looks like a honeycomb. Definitely not a honeycomb, please don't eat it. I'm going, Ugh. Oh, there's, there's some beetle in there. There's a shiny wing. Can you see that there, Ferg? Oh, get off my stick. There's a shiny wing of some kind of an insect. It smells. Something that eats insects. It is a reptile or a bird. I don't think bird, Herbs. The shape's wrong. Long and thin like that. Legavan, maybe? Snake? There's no track of a snake and this is quite fresh. Maybe this has got something to do with it. Maybe this is a clue. I'm going to figure it out. But while I do, Tristan has got something very small that is probably enjoying the sun. It is indeed, Jamie. It's much like us. We are loving the bit of sunshine that is coming down. And earlier I was referring to the dwarf mongoose that Hosanna was watching. And so there they are on top of their mound. And we're probably, I would say, maybe uh, 50 meters from the mound where um, Hosanna was sitting and is now completely fast asleep. He's dropped his head down and has gone 
flat, 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 and is almost invisible in the grass. But these are the dwarf mongoose that were catching his attention for a short period of time. And you can see there's one that's right on top and is watching out for the rest. The rest of them have started to move. They've come down the mound and they are now in the grasses and probably going to go and try and find food. But you'll find there's always a sentry that's kind of sitting on top and is watching and looking and making sure that the rest of them are all nice and safe and should it spot anything like Rosanna it will alarm call and they'll all come bounding into the mound. Oh, we can see a little tail sticking out now so maybe some more of them will come out and start to sun themselves. When I first spotted them there was quite a number of them. I see there's one that's come out onto the log there now where there's some sun. That one's going back in. He's warm now. If you go down a little bit Senzo you'll find another one. There we go. He's found himself a perfect patch of sun on that fallen over log. And I really love dwarf mongoose. They're such an interesting little creatures and always seem like they're up to no good. They kind of scuttle about everywhere and they're always watching and looking and seem to be really having a good time with life. So they're one of my favorite little creatures and it really is amazing the sort of social interactions that they have and the amount of sort of cohesion they have as a group it is very, very interesting to watch. Especially bearing in mind that they are little carnivores. If you look at most carnivores out here, very few of them are actually pride animals or pack animals. You've just got the wild dogs and the lions really. The rest of them tend to spend a large majority of their life on their own. So it's a quite an unusual thing for such a tight-knit unit of carnivores and the mongoose families all tend to display that. Well, not all mongoose, but the banded and the dwarf mongoose. Isn't that cute? Hello little one. It knows we're talking about it. It's now posing. It's on its log, it's like a... Oh, we're looking to the heavens now? I wonder if there's maybe not a bird of prey that's starting to fly. Sometimes you'll find the mongoose start looking up, and then if you scan around, you can actually find a bird flying over above, one of the predatory birds, and they kind of then look out for them. Well, that's all for our mongoose show, by the looks of it. It seems like they've all ducked into their little hideout, and that's where they're going to go for the rest of the day. Now, talking about birds and all things in the air, dwarf mongoose would not be show to you. So let's go across to James and his feathered friend. My favourite friend. I, I, it, I'm not sure this is my favourite friend. I do like them. That is a grey go-away bird, everybody. Oh, feathered friend. Yes, it is my feathered friend. The grey go away bird sitting atop a torchwood tree, unsurprisingly in torchwood, and doing not very much, but beautifully framed, just observing the view. It can probably see all sorts of things that we can't, on account of the fact that it is, of course, sitting now 20 metres above the ground. Now, the grey go away bird reminds me a lot of my childhood because it is one of the birds that exists in Johannesburg where I grew up and you can hear them calling throughout that city of a summer and it's a nice little touch of the wilderness that you get from it. Here comes Rexon. Ah yeah. yeah. Yeah, in Gene Torchwood. I'm just telling Rex that the leopard tracks went into Torchwood. Right, so that was our sighting. Uh, better than our Nyala sighting, of course, so things are looking up slightly. I do feel like uh, we're not doing quite as well as the other two, but we're doing our best. <gasps> David, there are two of them now. I'm often left wondering what a frugivorous bird like this eats during the course of the winter because of course there's not a lot of fruit for it to eat. That's what frugivorous means, David. It means eats fruit. Mm -hmm. You are not frugivorous. Yes, but not only. And you'll find that they will have to make do like the rest of the frugivorous birds on things like insects if they can find them. And they will have struggle to find insects as well and it's one of the reasons of course that so many birds will migrate. There's a third one David, good grief! And you see that? There's is its tail. It's a gathering, a whole breeding herd. 
Very nice. Canonymous it does, and in fact you wouldn't be the first person to have asked something like this. You said it looks like a black cockatoo. It does. If you look at them carefully, though, if you look at the beak, it's not a seed-eating beak. That beak is not quite hooked enough uh, to and, and toothed enough at the bottom to crack open the husks of seeds in the skilled way that a cockatoo would be able to. But they do look very cockatoo-like. And I always think they look deeply surprised. You know, when that crest sticks up, they look so very surprised to me. <laughs> and it's the first, I think this may be the first bird call I ever learned. And I learned it because my mother's cat, she's had as many cats you know, over the years, of course. They don't last that long. And um, they used to alarm call all of her cats have been murderous creatures and they've savaged the bird life of the greater Johannesburg area, now the Eastern Cape. And these things will alarm call at domestic cats and I'm pretty sure that's why it's the very first bird call I ever learned. Now, I've just had a wonderful uh, instruction from the final control to link to Jamie, who has got a very scary-looking Latin-speaking spider. Very scary, but I'm not sure how much Latin she speaks, especially since, unfortunately, this one is basically deceased. Uh, our, the Latin reference is in reference to the fact that one of the many names for this particular creature, let me not put my shadow on it, is a red Roman. So a red Roman spider. They're not actually true spiders, and we call them solifuges. The reason they're not true spiders, they don't have any spinnerets, they can't spin silk, and they definitely don't have any venom glands. However, as James has told you, they are scary looking, and that's because those jaws are capable of delivering a very, very powerful bite. I'm not sure what happened to this one. They are nocturnal, as you can tell from the pale color, and she's been injured. I keep I always refer to solifuges as a she, but she's got quite a broad abdomen, which makes me think I'm correct about that. The females are slightly bulkier, She's been injured in some way. I think most likely suspect is a bird. And these solifuges come out at night. They move very, very rapidly, and they're very difficult to catch. But for something like a small owl, it's entirely possible. And then what you'll probably find is that she bit and fought and got dropped. But unfortunately, damage here is pretty serious. She's obviously been crushed in talons. She's also missing the front of her pedipulps these limbs on the front here that are basically make it look as though a red roman has got five legs on either side, or ten legs in total. They don't, these are separate limbs used for catching their food. But she's missing the tips of it. And I'm not a hundred percent, you'll notice I'm quite gingerly touching her with this blade of grass. I'm not a hundred percent convinced that she's fully deceased. I can't see a heartbeat Usually you can with solifuges. You can see their, their, pulse, re, their pulse quite clearly. Now, pulse is perhaps the wrong word because they don't have blood vessels in the way that we do. They do have an organ. Ah, there we go. We've got a, a suggestion from Tristan as to the, the culprit behind said squidged solifuge, but I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but just to finish off what I was saying about the organs and the, the way that their heart beats, very, very simple heart that all it's doing is shifting liquid around because they've got an open system. They don't have blood vessels. It's just a, it's a hemocell and the liquid flows because it's got such short distances to travel. That way, gas, gas diffusion, anything like that, diffusion of nutrients, that can happen over a short space without having to have blood vessels to transport things. But there is a rudimentary heart and it does beat. I can't see it beating. Our Tristan's guess is that it was a lilac breasted roller that caught this particular solifuge. That's very specific. 
I've seen them catch them before. Absolutely could be. I have no reason to disagree with him and no evidence to the contrary. So that's entirely possible. Perhaps it would be that an owl would be more successful. Now, Kirk, that's the exact question I'm asking myself. Why didn't the bird finish it off? I suspect oh, it could be a couple of reasons. She could have fought back, especially if it was a slightly smaller bird, like a lilac-breasted roller. Um, she could have fought back and wriggled loose. They're very strong creatures. And whilst a, a, legs, a legs bird, that's not right, a bird's legs are quite tough and scaled, perhaps her jaws managed to meet with a softer part of the bird and she managed to get away. Or two birds could have fought over it and dropped it and not been able to find it again. Or, I guess potentially, they might have been interrupted by something else. I doubt it was us. I think we would have seen them. This is quite fresh, though but perhaps something else came around and they decided that their physical safety was more important than finishing off a big meal like this. Perhaps they just couldn't get around to swallowing it. Often birds take on more than they can chew, so to speak, because for that exact reason they don't chew. So sometimes they bite off more than they can swallow. Shame, girl. Still a little bit of resistance from its legs. Well, hopefully a bird comes along and finishes it off. Perhaps even a bird like the one that James has. I think that this bird would probably finish it off. It is a ground scraper thrush, an insect-eating bird. It rushes along the ground and picks up insects, but it wouldn't be, uh, well, it wouldn't look asconce at an edible arachnid even if it did have such vicious mandibles as the one you've just been looking at. And they're not very common here, and I always think that they're really quite fun to watch. Hopping around the place, they're beautiful colours, and really kind of interesting that they should be that colour on the front, and then so well camouflaged at the back. Male and female, exactly the same colour. That's a very good, very good question, Akeem. I'm not sure that I know the answer to this. You say, I feel like I may have read it though, you say, why do some birds hop and some birds walk? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, one of the reasons is the, is the back claw, I think, is probably one of the reasons. The birds that walk tend to be things like the lapwings and the thick knees and they don't have or they've got a very shortened back f claw so most of the passerines like this bird here have got three front facing toes and one back facing toe and the thrushes are no different and that foot is designed to perch so they're designed to perch on branches obviously this thing feeds on the ground and so it hops around on the ground but the birds that live on the ground and do a lot of running and walking tend not, but like us, to have a back-facing toe. And I think you'll find that the hoppers are probably those with back-facing toes, and it makes it very difficult for them to walk, and therefore they hop. Am I in the sun, David? Yes. yes. Uh, so much so that I can't look at the camera. And so I think that's probably why you have some hopping birds and some uh, walking birds. And Royal Gam, you are so amazed with what my, <laughs> what my favourite is, a hopping or running bird. Well, ah, it's very difficult to say, but I am going to go with hopping. I just think that the hopping is, a, is an exceptional way of locomotion. And interestingly, hopping. What kind of hopping? Alice, I'm deeply confused. Is there more than one kind of hopping? Oh, what kind of hopping bird? Right, what kind of hopping bird? Oh, I, I don't know. I, I haven't given it much thought, really. I suppose the white brought scrub robin, which is my favourite bird out here, is a hopper. So probably that one. Shall we move on, David? Good. Hopping birds. Hopping, of course, as I've told some of you before, 
is a an extremely oh there it's perching it's not hopping is an extremely efficient way of moving no that's gorgeous yes it's an extremely efficient way of moving that's what I said and it's extremely efficient because it allows the hopper to utilize the potential energy that is built up in the muscles when they spring forward and the potential energy gained by being in the air so when you when you land if you hop on the ground and you land it doesn't feel like you've got much energy it feels like you're losing all the energy that you've got but there is a certain springiness in the muscles and in the ligaments that must absorb that you, the sort of shock and if you can utilize that um, the sort of elasticity of your muscles that absorb that shock and jump quickly again it becomes very efficient and that's why that's how the birds do it and it's also of course how kangaroos do it and it's why so many things in Australia hop because it's a very nutrient poor continent and if you are new if it's a nutrient poor well you need to be able to move it the most efficient way possible over long distances and hopping is a very good way of doing that you're not a hopper, are you, David? No, you're more a runner. Yes. You don't have a back-facing claw, either. No. Nor do kangaroos, of course. Now, I smelt some warthogs around... warthogs, waterbuck around here, sorry. And I'm rather hoping we might see them, because that's something to look at. It's a mammal. David, do you see any water buck anywhere? I'm just going to turn off and ease our way down onto the cheetah cut line. And I'm going to, I'm not sure if Tristan is still with Hosanna, I'm assuming not. And they're probably all trying to find Shungile right now. Ah. Tristan does have a sighting, but of a different kind. We're not going to go across to him just yet because I've spotted some impala. Yes! And the squirioto! Can you see it there, David? Good morning, squirioto. I don't actually know whether that's what a squirrel is. It's Herbert speaks a little bit of Italian. A scheleotto, I think he calls it. Well, the scheleotto has disappeared. No, there it is. It's right here. Look, it's got a little nest there. See the hole there? Bottom there. Bottom there, yeah. It lives there. It's wonderful. And then at the top again. <coughs> Maurizio, you say fantastico. Yes, thank you very much. It is very fantastico. And that um, that uh, lilac-breasted roller nearly made the Scuriotto's day very much less than fantastico. There, it's going into the hole. There are two of them. I think let's just stay on the hole because they come in and out very quickly. That's quite a nice little home they have. Of course, they will want to avoid snakes going in and out of it. You can hear the... Oh, there Have you got him out? No, oh, yes. Popped his head out. Hello. <laughs> I think he's sticking his head out because the lilac-breasted roller above is going... <laughs> in a very irritated fashion. Come on, put your head out. This is, of course, the famous African tree squirrel. Famous throughout the land. I'm not sure why I said that. <laughs> let's, let's carry on. Now, the male leopard, I don't know if they've told you this, there's been a male leopard found in Torchwood. And the male leopard is... Gijima, not Tingana. So Tingana is somewhere around here. <clears throat> of 
course, nowhere near where I am. That's as much as clear. Right, we're on the southern boundary, everybody. We're going to have a quick impala sighting. I've no doubt they'll run away as soon as we get anywhere near looking at them. There we go, David. Is that the best impala sighting you've ever had? Mm. Hello, Martin. You're wondering about gazelles and impala and if they're the same thing. They are not. <coughs> they are... <coughs> excuse me. Part of a different family. They're very closely related, I suppose, but they're not quite the same. And we don't get any gazelles in this part of the world. We get, oh, I mean, our national mammal is a gazelle called a springbok. And we don't find them here. We find them up again in the drier areas. And that's the only gazelle that we get here. Sorry, I just need to move out of the way here. Sor! Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, that's lucky. Um, and uh, what are some of the typical characteristic differences? Well, <clears throat> I suppose male and female gazelles have got horns, as far as I know. And I mean, their digestive systems are very similar. Their breeding. I, uh, sort of strategies are very similar yeah, so it's very difficult to say I mean the, genetically they must be quite different from each other but I mean <laughs> it's now I'm making a hash of explaining to you the big differences because I'm not sure that I know um, what they are anyway those are not gazelles there's an antelope good on we go <coughs> Just listening to Herbert talking on the radio. Ah, I've lost him. Now we're going to go down towards Twin Dams and see what we can find there. I'm not sure how stable our signal is going to be where we are now, but we will maintain it for as long as we can. Everything's all right. They're still in there. God. I've just... <laughs> apparently we're going to go across to Jamie now and what I heard was that she's on a violent bushwalk. A violent bushwalk? Never. I don't think we're on a violent bushwalk. I mean, Ferg's looking pretty angry over there, but I don't think he's going to get violent anytime soon. Especially not after... <laughs> yeah, that was terrifying, Burke. <laughs> Definitely not, eh? Oh, thank you, Herbie. You're a legend. It's got warm all of a sudden. Oh, definitely, Ferg is not going to get violent. I do know what James means, though. We've had a dead solifuge or a dying solifuge. Uh, we've had a mantis attacking an ant. What else have we had? Some tracks. They're not very violent. Not at all. Oh, we've made our way all the way. I mean, we've walked a, a fair amount. We've done all of the sort of the western boundary of Juma. We're now on the southern boundary, and I wasn't planning on walking along Triple M, but bumped into Tristan, who pointed out some tracks of a big male lion coming onto Juma itself. Question for all of you. Do you have any idea which direction that lion came from this afternoon? Or not this afternoon, last night. Do you know if he came from the south? Because I suspect that those lion tracks are him but I'm not 100% sure, and maybe there's a male lion sitting somewhere in here. I'm not too sure. We're going to sort of slowly but surely make our way in that direction. Hmm. I don't really want to walk all the way along Gowrie Main, though. It's not a very exciting road to walk along. I might just check, just check carefully here, in case there's a buffalo in the mud wallow. But otherwise, the insects, now that it's started to heat up, the insects are hiding away. The animals are hiding away. 
We're going to see what else we can find. I might, if there's no other guides that are going in that direction, I might pop my head in and see what Hassan is up to, just to see how he is still with us on foot and to see whether or not he's still comfortable with that. I think he will be. I think he'll be exactly the same. I mean, I've sat meters from Hassana, and very soon that's going to, when he becomes independent, that those opportunities are gone. That's it, they're done. We'll never ever have those opportunities again with Hosanna and Shongile. So it'd be nice to, especially because I'll be going to Kenya in about three weeks time. It'd be very nice to spend the last few moments with them, or the last few weeks enjoying moments like that. Are there any buffaloes in there, Herbs? No, <laughs> that's good. Let's see whether this male lion popped out here. I doubt it. I think he's gonna keep walking that way. I suspect those tracks come from last night. They have been driven over a few times. Don't forget to send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, just while I'm thinking about it. Careful, Her oh, Ferg, don't, don't go into the mud. Ferg just did such a very nimble hop, skip and jump. Did you ever dance, Fergus? Because that was a very neat little sidestep you did. Okay, no sign of the lion coming to drink here. This is one of the leopard cub's favorite spots. Hmm, okay, that's interesting. Chris Rogue, thank you for answering the question on the male lion. Apparently he came from the east and headed west. So he came from the east. Maybe it's a different lion, you never know. Unless he went on a little bit of a, a round, roundabout route. I'm not too sure. But I think it might be worth going to have a look. But let's walk, we're gonna continue along the fire break for a little bit and see what we can find on there. The southern boundary is a wonderful place to go. <laughs> Sorry, that was my fault in the shadow. Um, the southern boundary is always a good place to check and maybe we might get lucky and bump into little Shongile. That's also what I'm hoping for. And Tristan is convinced that she's somewhere around this area, so perhaps we'll have a chance to see her. And what we'll do is we'll just get Tristan to check Philemon's cut line on his way home if he comes along that route, and maybe he can look for some lion tracks popping out there. I don't think, obviously, the reason I'm not focusing too much on trying to track down that male lion is I don't think he's still on the property. I think he's gone, and I think it's the same one. <laughs> Thanks. All right, let's see what else we can find. I'm curious to see whether or not Hosanna and Shungile are still with following each other around. Dear watcher, you want to know how much do we walk on bushwalk? Probably on average, I would say my walks are usually, it depends what we're doing. Sometimes we walk straight out of camp into a really nice sighting and then we stay there for, or we walk around the water holes. I would say mine average probably around seven or so. Ferg, how far do you think we've walked Manai now? Must be about five. Uh, between five and 50. Between five and 50, says Ferg. Yeah, I tend to do quite long bush walks. So does James and Brent tends to sprint. Uh, of course, somebody has to do the hard work out here. Hope he's laughing because he knows exactly what I mean. Someone has to do the hard work around here. We can't all jump on a vehicle. But let's go and see how Tristan's doing on the comfort of the vehicle seat. <laughs> well, I'm not so sure comfort is the right terminology for dry M North. It's about as corrugated as it gets and all you end up doing is rattling along and bouncing around and your teeth end up chattering. So if you see the camera lens shaking, I do apologize. But yes, it is a little bit more comfortable than them probably walking, especially as far as Jamie has walked because Jamie has walked quite far. I bumped into her just now all the way on Gary Main. So it's going to be a long ride home for her, that's for sure. But the reason why we've come up this way is because there was a reports of a male lion moving in a easterly direction from Simambili towards the gate area. So I'm just going to go and have a little look and see. I can't manage to get anybody on the radio to confirm whether or not it's crossed, but I'm going to go and try my luck anyway and just see. Maybe you never know, one of the Birminghams might have crossed into our side and we might get lucky. Now, it's interestingly enough, apparently four 
of them were seen yesterday, which is the first time in a while that all four were seen. There was two on a property called Hoffmanns, one on Vessels with the Sticks and Cubs, and one in Arethusa, or sorry, actually not on Arethusa, on Elephant Plains. And so there are a few of them around. And this morning I found tracks of only one crossing into Juma um, from the southern side, but I believe that there must be another one that would have come from here because the guys were telling me that it's a different male line that they found this afternoon to the one that they had, I mean this morning, to the one that they had yesterday. So, could potentially mean that there's somewhere a sneaky male lion sitting on Juma and we're going to try and see if we can't find where that could be. The problem is with these males is a lot of the time they tend to come through Juma in the middle of the night and then go north into Biffles Hook and Manuleti and all of those areas or into Simamili. So, maybe, just maybe, with a stroke of luck, we'll be able to find these hooligan males somewhere around here. It's been so long since I've seen the Birminghams, and in fact, since I've seen any Birminghams together. Now, what is that in the distance there? Let's have a look quickly, Senzo. I can spot something far in the distance, but I don't know what it is. It looks like maybe impalas. That's what I'm gonna go with. And I would have won an award. They are indeed. You can see a bit of the heat haze that is starting to happen now. I was saying earlier that it's quite a warm day today and you can already see that there's a bit of that heat haze starting to form as the impalas are obscured by it in the distance and they're all happily feeding along. So no male lion there at this stage, I don't think. So we'll try and see if we can't go past those and a little bit further on. If it did cross, it would have crossed a lot further north than that. Now, unfortunately, we are in Jigger, and Jigger's shocks are not very good, so I don't think I'm going to stay on this particular road for too much longer. Like I say, we've been bounced around a little bit, and it's a little bit unpleasant to be on, so I think we'll probably turn off as soon as we can. To try and use the parallel roads to this to try and see if there's any tracks for those males. Now, there was also a report of elephants somewhere around here, but I haven't seen a single track for them, so well, there might be magic elephants that have flown, but we'll look out for them as well. And while we do that, I believe James Hendry is also in search of something, and so far has been in vain. Well, everything's been evading me, so there's a very wide category of things to be searching for. In that shadow there, uh, just to the left of that, in fact, just behind that bush. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Yes, in there is another cryptic piece of photography going on. So cryptic that I cannot see where it's gone. There was a diker, we had lovely diker sighting. And the diker sightings, of course, have been few and far between with the grass this long. Likewise, those of the Stien Bok have been, well, conspicuous by their um, absence. Not there. All righty, let's go a little bit forward. We're on the way to Treehouse Dam. I know we've been there this, well, we haven't been there this morning, but just as the heat builds, so things are likely to come down towards the water. Oh, please excuse the hat that is perched on my head at a jaunty angle. I'm just trying to protect the side of my face from the sun. I feel it was getting a little bit burned. Do you think it looks nice, David? Do I look gangster? Yes, very gangster. Yes, I think I'd be an excellent gangster, don't you? Maybe a Tsotsi, yes. A Tsotsi, everyone, is a South African gangster. <laughs> okay. Kirsten McLennan, I'm not going to say what she said. Okay. <laughs> we, we, we are going to, towards the three house dam, as I was saying, because it's getting hot. And so things are going to come down to have a drink, maybe elephants, maybe those buffalo that have been around here. It's a, oh, or maybe Zeus the Kudu. That is not Zeus the Kudu. That is Casper, the invisible Kudu. Let's go forward again. There we are. Who thought you could hide from us, didn't you? <laughs> no, you cannot. Not like your cowardly cousin, the Nyala. Here we are. Found some friends in amongst the 
continuing the theme of the cryptic photography, abstract photography. Oh, a little baby kudu, two cow kudus, one the young cow kudu, one an old cow kudu, and one a baby cow kudu. Three different sizes, David. Isn't that nice? Reminds me of the three bears and the story of Goldilocks and the porridge. You remember that? Hmm. Now, a kudu, were to see a predator, of course, makes the most outlandish sound. It is a bark. That sounds like a particularly aggravated dog. <sighs> but they are spectacular looking animals when they're out in the open. But even the little one you can see. Now that male does not have a particularly large rack of horns. They are judged normally by the width of the horns. I mean, how or whether that actually means that they are effective as male kudu, I'm not sure. But somebody sent me a nice, uh, I forget who it was, and I apologize if you are watching. You sent me a very nice article, well, not article, you, a, a tweet about the fact that the spiral horns allow the kudu to keep, uh, how did it go? Apparently the angle at which they they turn allows the kudu to keep its potential enemy in view all the time. So they never block the view that the kudu is able to have of its rival, which I thought was very interesting indeed. I'm still trying to figure out how that works. And when I'm talking about the width of the kudu, the point of that is that, you know, when people talk about how um, about how kudu are, they have a wide rack, you know, and it all comes from the hunting industry, so they've decided that it's valuable, a dominant, a big dominant kudu bull has got wide horns, but I don't think there's any biological basis for that. There's no reason that a kudu with horns that wide shouldn't be just as dominant as one with wider ones. Now, Riti, you want to know if they are related to the deers. They are no, not related to the deer. Uh, there are no deer in Africa, everybody. There are no um, resident or naturally occurring deer in Africa. We have a couple of European species that have been naturalized to one or two areas, not the Kruger Park, of course. They would be uh, removed forthwith if they arrived here. And there is apparently, a, I think, a wild population of deer somewhere up in near the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. But the kudu are antelope, they are not deer. I don't know if you ever look at an animal, David, and think to yourself, that looks like a friend of mine. Do you know do you know what I mean? I've just had that feeling. Which of course is very unkind. I'm thinking of a w woman I know but uh, she doesn't look like that, obviously, but there was something about the facial expression that the kudu pulled that made me think of her. <laughs> I'm not going to tell her that, nor her husband, who is about six feet and five inches tall and a fairly large and brutish fellow, so I think I'll keep that to myself. Let's move on. The water's just down here. A uh, quick look there. Goodbye. I nearly said her name there. I'm not going to do that. I'm quite impressed with the way I've placed my hat on my head. There's an elephant. Mainly because I have managed not to reveal my bald head, but at the same time move the hat around to its jaunty angle. I knew we should have come down here earlier. This elephant has finished drinking. Maybe he hasn't. He's got a lovely set of tusks. They're asymmetrical, David, which of course is, uh, I suppose for a modern person like you, must be quite appealing. Good grief, did you see that? <laughs> it's like the, 
The Egyptian goose came flying past, suddenly saw the elephant, and then stuck its feet out as if it was going to have an accident. And of course you can now hear completely that real sort of change in the sound and atmosphere of the bush as we go towards the midday. Well, not midday, really, mid-morning. As we start to contemplate the joys of Amanda's breakfast. Of course, today is Wednesday, which means it's shopping trip, which means there's not going to be a lot to eat today, David. Just quickly, before we follow the elephant, uh, there's some hippo. You see them there, Dave? Very nice. They aren't really hippo, of course, everyone. They are terrapins. Sometimes confused with hippo. Now, let us... He's... I'm just going to carry on. He seems to be coming across the front of the damn wall, which is very nice. I'll put the hat on straight, because the side of my face is no longer exposed to the sun. Get out of my way! You out of your way. Good morning. Ah, he's a very lovely bull. He's probably about twenty-five years old, I'd say. Just having a nice morning drink, and now he's having some delicious leaves for breakfast. David, that could well be what we're going to eat for breakfast today. You've seen the parlous state of our pantry. <laughs> now, while you're not interested in the vagaries of our shopping order, everybody, I will tell you that the person responsible for the shopping order last week <laughs> ordered a quite astonishing amount of bacon not much else. Oh, OK. Hang on a second. This is quite interesting. Let me sit up and stop talking about the shopping order. I'm not very worried about this chap because he's not very old. He's a youngster, so I think he's just showing us that he's a big and tough fellow, especially with his rapier tusks. Nasty. He's got a nasty cut in his foot, hey? Oh, and there. He's been stabbed. Well, if this was a very large must bull, I would be tempted to try and back off, but uh, he's a youngster, so he's not, I'm not too worried about him. He's also kicked his back right foot. He's kicked against a stone or something. He's stubbed his toe. Uh, stubbing my toes makes me very angry. Shame. So he's obviously had a bit of conflict, either with another bull, or quite possibly he was in a herd causing trouble, and one of the cows thought this is no good, and gave him a bit of a push. But his tusks are very cow-like. He's got very um, thin tusks. And I don't know if that represents any kind of hormonal difference from the big thick tusked bulls, but if you saw just what you're looking at now, You'd be tempted to say that's a cow straight off because though the cows have tend to have straighter and thinner tusks. And this guy has got a very thin straight tusk. He doesn't look very comfortable or very happy. So maybe he's feeling a little bit lonely. I wish we understood the social dynamics of elephants a bit better. I wish we understood how their emotions work, because they certainly seem to be emotional creatures. Oh, he's got a small flatulence issue, but that's okay. Anybody who eats 
or any animal that eats that amount of vegetation is going to have that issue because they do of course have an enormous amount of bacteria in their guts which in turn produce an enormous amount of gas. So he'll just have to lurk around on his own. He's also not looking in the best of condition. His bones are sticking out a little bit. And that's not ideal, especially at this time of the year. I mean, he should be in tip-top shape after a good rainy season with lots of good stuff to eat. And interestingly, he's not grazing at all. He's only browsing right now. He's eating Zizifus, which tends to be a, a great elephant favourite, the buffalo thorn. Hmm. <laughs> Hello, Violet. You say, do elephants get tusk cavities? They don't get cavities, no. I mean, they don't... Those that, you know, they, they tend to stay off the toffees and off the Coca-Cola. And so what tends to happen is that they avoid getting cavities, which of course are caused in us by foods we were never designed to eat. But, Violet, they can get abscesses. So the nerve can die inside the tooth there. I mean, and in us that's often caused by a cavity, but I think in them probably caused by some other form of infection that's come in via the mouth. And then it can be very painful and eventually the tusk will fall out but they can be very very nasty when they have that is sort of experience where they have uh, you know they ha they get these dreadful well they get dreadful pain and then they become quite nasty they become quite uh, oh, i hate to use the term aggressive but they can become aggressive because of the pain Hello, Riti. Of course, the, the most uh, qu clear question, I guess, about them is the one you've asked about whether or not the tusks, or why they have the tusks. What is the point of having tusks on the front of your face like that? Well, as with horns, they are there for defense to some extent, but they're also very, very useful for feeding. And he will use those tusks, and you can see that he's... I mean, I'm not sure why his right one is so much shorter than his left. I suspect it could be because he uses it more. But he will use it to scrape and chip away at bark in trees. He'll use it to wedge branches between his trunk and his tusks so that he can break them more effectively, more easily. And he will use them to uh, dig up roots and that sort of thing. So largely for feeding, Riti, although they can, of course, be used for defense. But I think if their principal purpose was defense, I think you'd find that they were the same on all elephants in the same way that they are the same or very similar in most antelope species. Not most antelope species, but antelope within a species. Nice. Oh, he's moved on to some grass. And I guess there must be an element of display as well, perhaps, to the cows. Perhaps there's an element of displaying how big their tusks are, and maybe big... T I'm not sure if the evidence shows that big tusked elephants have got a greater chance of mating than small tusked ones. I'm not sure about that. Poor fellow, he looks a bit forlorn for some reason. Ginny, you're wondering about what kind of illnesses an elephant can get. Ginny, I don't... I'm not actually sure. I, I don't think they get common colds and that sort of thing. They don't suffer from domestic 
um, animal diseases, so they don't get things like, you know, bovine tuberculosis or um, corridor diseases or that sort of thing. So I'm I'm not sure what they get. I think you'll probably find that they, I mean, they must be filled with parasites, as we all are, and I'm sure those parasites sometimes, the, the load of parasites sometimes creates a, an amount of disease. But I couldn't tell you exactly what those were. We think elephants are able to self-medicate themselves. So they will find a, a tree that helps them to look better to look better, to feel better, if they're feeling a bit peaky. But um, I couldn't tell you exactly what those illnesses were, I'm afraid. But he's now completely comfortable with us, and I think he was just shaking his head at us, telling us that he's a big and strong and not to be trifled with on a day like today. And we won't trifle with him, will we, David? Indeed, I think we shall probably leave him wandering off towards the kudus. That is a very peaceful scene. Hmm. And let's just have a quick look at that bird there, a starling. Laurie, you're wondering about whether or not the herd would chase away a diseased elephant. No, I don't think they would at all. I think it would be quite the opposite. They are very good at looking after their sick, aged and infirm. So I think that they probably would not chase it away at all. I'm not sure that they have any understanding of infection. I mean, you think how long it took for us human beings to understand infection and how long it took for us to figure out that infection, we call it bacterial pathogens, travel in the air. I really am not sure that the elephants have managed to figure that out. Okay, let's head across to Tristan. He is still very bravely and I must say stoically and manfully searching for the lions. Well, our search for the lions has not gone well at all. There is nothing that we can find. There is only a track that goes into Manuleti, but nothing that is too fresh. It looks like it was from early last night. So it's not the lion we have that we were hoping to find. I believe he's still probably somewhere on Simamili, but it will be good for this afternoon, potentially this evening. As the sun sets, maybe he'll get up and move and start moving towards the area and back into Vuyatela. So we're just now bumbling around hoping to find something interesting. So far it's been a very, very pleasant morning. It's been nice just to go around and see Hosanna and just to see all the sights again after being away for a few days. It's very, very pretty in the bush at the moment and still a little green tinge after that rain, so it still feels a little bit summery. But we do have a roadblock up ahead, which is a whole bunch of impalas. Good morning, ladies. Now, I'm sure you lot did not sleep very well at all. So, Tutukat, you're wondering whether prey animals would recognize predator tracks. Well, if it's quite fresh, then they do. They often find something like buffalo. They'll come along, and if lions have walked there, they stop and they sniff, and they really look around to see what's going on. So they do recognize that there is a, probably a scent more than the actual footprint itself. Footprint itself, I don't think they care too much, but it does leave behind a scent, and that is what will sort of trigger the, the response from a prey animal. So whenever they sort of come across an area where a predator has walked, you'll find that they'll stop and they'll be a lot more aware of what's going on. But as you can see, our ladies are slowly starting to move now. They're coming out of the open clearings and are now moving into the thickets to try and find some shade and food. But they would have had a very tough night last night. They are the herd that comes from quarantine, which means they would have had male lions roaring around them. They would have had leopard sawing as well. So it would have probably been a very sleepless night for the Impala herd of quarantine clearings. And see a little baby that's just relieving itself. And it's amazing how much they've grown, these little ones. I tend to forget that they were only born a few months ago. Some of these little Impala lambs are only five, six months old. So 
they really are quite big compared to when they're born. They're so little and fragile when they're born and they grow and develop very quickly. You can see there's a little male with his small horns that have now popped through. Very, very, very pretty. And a little oxpecker that's driving him mad and going into the ears and up the nose. Always makes me laugh when the oxpeckers are on these antelopes' heads. You can see they go all over the place. And it must be so frustrating to have a bird climbing inside your ear from time to time. You can see he tried to get rid of the oxpecker, but this oxpecker is clinging for dear life at this stage. There we go. He's grooming around those horn areas. Is that not very comfortable, little one? There we go, that's far more comfortable. Now this is the red-billed oxpecker, so we see two types of oxpeckers in this area. We get the yellow-billed and the red-billed. The red-billed are the far more common species that we see, and you'll find them on most of the antelope, cleaning and sort of grooming them and making sure they get rid of all those parasites that these antelope often pick up by walking through the grass. Ah, so Jamie, I believe, has had a bit of luck on bushwalk, so let's quickly go across to her and see what she's got. We have indeed had some luck. We've got some moving grass on top of a termite mound. That is Hosanna. Sneaking round, having a look at us. Can you see him from that side, Herbie? Let's just go, Ferg, let's just go around ever so slightly. Obviously we're not going to scare him and we're not going to stay for too long. It's the last opportunity that we're going to have to do this. Well, one, of, one of my last opportunities. Keep going, Herbie. There he is. Hello, my boy. Hey, I'm going to miss this. Going to miss you? Yes, little one. <laughs> I'm glad that when I do leave, I'll know that he's healthy, happy, and more than capable of looking after himself. And he won't stay this comfortable and relaxed. I mean, we're, we're less than 10 meters away from him. And you never, ever get to do that with a wild leopard, except here, with these special cubs. It really is an absolute privilege. Hey, my man, you look after yourself, huh? Not that this is, I'm not leaving just yet, but this might be the very last opportunity I get to spend any time with him on foot. Who knows? what may happen in the next three weeks. Uh, taking this opportunity is special. You're so invisible. Yes, you are. We can't see you. I promise. <laughs> it's okay, little man. Sweet. These are the leopard cubs that have given me the most amazing opportunities to spend with them on foot. <laughs> That's really very special. And what we're going to do is we're going to leave now. That's all. I just wanted to say hello and bye-bye to him on foot in case the opportunity doesn't present itself in the future. I'm sure I'll see him again on drive before I leave. And we'll be back, of, co of course. But things won't be the same. They won't ever be the same as they have been now with Shungila and Hosanna. Two special little leopards. We are close. We're very close. I don't want to push it too much. And I don't want to make him feel like he has to move. Yeah, hey, my beautiful little boy. So as, finish, as soon as we finish the end of the sunrise safari, then we'll head off. Hopefully James or Tristan will give us a lift home. But this is definitely the best ever ending. I can't believe how invisible he is flat up against that termite mound. With skills like that, I think Hosanna is going to be absolutely fine. The ability to hide. There really is not another place in the world you can do this with a leopard. And certainly not that many leopards even here. Tingana is not the same. But Karula, well, we've been lucky with her and we've been lucky with her cubs. Oh, on that note, it is time for us to start heading for breakfast. I can hear my stomach rumbling, and perhaps unless Hassan is going to provide me with some bacon and eggs, I think it's time for us to head home. So a big thank you to Ferg for his wonderful camera work. I'm sorry I walked you all over the reserve. Uh, really I did too. 
And then a very special thank you to Alice and to Megan in Final Control. And most importantly, a big thank you to all of you for joining us on the Sunrise Safari. What I'm going to do for the last 20 seconds, I'm going to duck in front of you. I'm going to see if we can give you one last view. <laughs> He's so hidden. All right. One. We'll follow up with him on the Sunset Safari, everybody. But until we see you then, there's a twitching ear. Have a wonderful day.